Yet our campaigns have failed to prevent human trafficking. Over the last 10 years, global profits from human trafficking have increased by 37%. Human traffickers continue to bypass our prevention tactics. Traffickers prey on existing and emerging vulnerabilities. Our current methods of prevention are not working. So our strategies must also evolve. Beyond posters, beyond slogans. Our goal is to intensify and accelerate effective and innovative prevention strategies. It is critical that we strengthen our prevention strategies. Join us. Join us. Join us in shaping this pivotal change. Imagine a world where human trafficking isn't just about raising awareness. Your expertise can light the way. Your expertise can light the way. Be a light. Be part of the solution. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 24th Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons Conference. It is a great honor and pleasure to open this conference. I am delighted that the political leaders and participants from all 57 OSCE participating states and eight partners for cooperation, as well as many international organizations, over 120 NGOs, many experts with lived experience of human trafficking, 66 academic institutions, 19 businesses, and five media outlets are joining us in person and online. Our conference will primarily be conducted in English, but please note that translation in all the official OSCE languages is available both online and in person. Please also note that the conference is being recorded and broadcast live on the OSCE website. It is also being recorded by one media outlet. Today and tomorrow, here in the heart of Vienna, we will dedicate our time and attention to review and rethink human trafficking prevention strategies. To do so effectively, we will, among other things, consider adaptations needed to make sure our prevention measures also capture and counter new or emerging or often overlooked trafficking trends. Why? Because human trafficking continues to grow in scope and scale, which implies that our prevention measures are ineffective and insufficient in combating evolving trafficking methods. They are not keeping pace with traffickers. The latest available data estimates estimates that the illegal profits from human trafficking have increased by at least 37% over the past 10 years, reaching $236 billion annually. $236 billion. To fully grasp this scale, let me draw a couple of comparisons. This number is higher than the national economies of 35 out of 57 OSCE participating states. In fact, 236 billion is higher than the national economy of 17 OSCE participating states combined. The profits generated from the abuse of each victim has grown. 21% higher, in fact, now reaching a staggering 10,000 US dollars per victim per year. And to emphasize why this is critical to the OSCE region in particular, the total illegal profits are by far the highest in Europe and Central Asia. Human trafficking is first and foremost a financially motivated crime. And while traffickers are the key perpetrators, it is the demand from end users that drives and incentivizes the traffickers. Put simply, traffickers choose to exploit victims because they know they can make vast amounts of money from their abuse and they choose to do it here in the OSCE region because this is where the economic gain is the highest. But combating the demand that attracts traffickers in our region is about so much more than just reducing the reward and increasing the cost for traffickers. It is about preventing the immense harm suffered by the victims. In sum, this means that our overall efforts to combat 
and eventually end human trafficking are not only insufficient, but increasingly insufficient. The forms of the crime have expanded, the nature of the crime has evolved, and our ability and effort to adjust and respond accordingly is lagging behind. This is why we are dedicating this year's Alliance Conference to critically rethink and reshape our prevention strategies, focusing on moving beyond awareness raising to achieve genuine impact we need to mobilize the necessary will and collective action required. We do that by first taking stock of what works, speaking with and listening to experts and survivors with lived experience to help us assess how we can more effectively address the new forms of trafficking we see emerging or the overlooked forms we need to better combat. This means we need to thoroughly analyze the various prevention efforts and make sure that they are also targeted and tailored. Just as criminal methods are evolving, we must also adapt and innovate our approach. By attending this conference, you have chosen to be part of this collective effort, and we are grateful that you are choosing to be part of creating the necessary solutions. Now, before giving the floor to the impressive lineup of opening and keynote speakers who will be addressing you, let me also recognize the contributions of other panelists and speakers for the conference. First, let me elaborate on the program for the conference. After our distinguished welcoming and keynote addresses, panel one will dive deeper into the nature of the problem, an often missing piece in many states' policies and actions by providing a comprehensive understanding of the diverse set of vulnerabilities that traffickers target and exploit, and that we, the anti-trafficking practitioners, might have overlooked or underestimated in our attempts to prevent human trafficking. We need this comprehensive understanding to inform our ability to implement effective, impactful, and targeted prevention strategies to address both the existing and emerging forms of this crime. This discussion will also aim to recognize the intersectionality of gender, racial, social, and economic inequalities that can increase the vulnerability of trafficking. Day two will focus on bridging the gaps we have identified and outline solutions for more effective prevention strategies. We will start day two with panel two in the morning, exploring ways to meld data and action through offering solutions that address gaps in quantitative and qualitative data to inform prevention strategies and measures. Following pa panel two, there will be a moderator-led talk with an excellent lineup of experts who will critically examine the challenges in tackling emerging forms of trafficking and how they affect current anti-trafficking responses, particularly prevention efforts. Some of you may remember the survivor-led conversations was, that we held at the Alliance last year in a similar format, and it is in light of its success that we are replicating this format this year. In the very last panel tomorrow, panel three, we will culminate our discussions with a focus on solutions and recommendations. We must move beyond awareness raising and reshape our methods and approaches to prevention. Here we will showcase examples of legislative actions as a tool for prevention, the power of multi-agency collaboration and coordination and impact that media can bring to ramp up anti-trafficking prevention. As per OSCE tradition, in the program we have included side events, and this year we have five, three organized by our office and two by our partners. They will all take place during the lunch tomorrow between 1230 and 1500. I encourage you all to take a closer look at the program for these side events as they will supplement our panel discussions with some very interesting in-depth analysis and data on specific vulnerabilities, such as the nexus between human trafficking and disabilities and human trafficking and minorities. This year, I am very grateful that in each of our panel discussions, we will have the expertise of people who themselves have lived experience of human trafficking. They will provide vital insights to critically evaluate the efficacy and impact of our prevention efforts, to make sure that our prevention methods are actually effective and reach the people we are trying to reach. Allow me to also thank all the other panelists and speakers who will share their expertise in the course of these two days. Each of them will offer insight and advice for states to step up their efforts to prevent and combat human trafficking at the national, regional, and international levels. We appreciate that each and every one of you have dedicated your time to be here with us today and tomorrow. 
Let me lastly add a couple of technical points. Behind me, you will see a secretariat desk where you can sign up to take the floor for each panel discussion. Interventions are only available in person and the moderator will announce when it is your turn. We strive to accommodate as many speakers as possible to have the floor, but we'll do so according to the allocated time for each session. So we ask that you also be mindful of the time. The microphone for floor interventions for civil society is located in the back. Now let me introduce our first distinguished guest. I am pleased to welcome the OSCE Secretary General, Helga Schmidt, to give us her welcoming remarks. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the 24th Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons Conference. The OEC has proudly become a world leader on assisting its participating states in the fight against trafficking in human beings. And this annual conference, which brings together high level political representatives, national authorities, international and civil society organization, trafficking survivors, and this is so important, and let me really thank you for being with us today, and of course, anti-trafficking grassroots activists, serves as the foundation of our joint effort to combat this crime. That the diversity of stakeholders in this room underlines the fact that human trafficking affects the whole of society and all of our societies, and that we recognize that it is our shared responsibility to combat this problem, which preys on the most vulnerable segments of society. 21 years ago, OEC participating states adopted the OEC Action Plan on Combat Trafficking in Human Beings. This seminal document and its 2005 and 2013 addenda set out our framework for addressing the crime across the areas of prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnerships. And for the last 21 years, we have endeavored in each of these areas and real progress has been made. Progress in identifying victims, prosecuting traffickers, and confiscating illicit proceeds, and in listening to those with lived experience. But despite all that has been achieved, it is an uncomfortable truth that human trafficking is as embedded in our societies and economies as it has ever been. Over the past decade alone, the estimated profits generated from human trafficking have increased by 37%, and the wider OEC region remains the most profitable globally for trafficking in human beings. Mm. Driven by the rise of new forms of exploitation, such as forced criminality, the crime has also become more pervasive. This forces us to confront the sobering reality that while our efforts to protect vi victims and prosecute perpetrators may be succeeding at the local level in some contexts, our current strategies for prevention are not. It is therefore critical that we reshape our approach to prevention, and this is why our discussions over these next two days are so vital. If they are to ever defeat trafficking, and this undoubtedly must be our shared ambition, effective approaches to prevention must be the bedrock upon which our anti-trafficking efforts are being built. Preventing trafficking in human beings from taking place is the best way to truly protect vulnerable groups and deprive traffickers of the illicit proceeds the crime generates. Reimagining prevention requires us to examine the vulnerabilities that traffickers exploit and that may otherwise be overlooked or underestimated. This includes persons belonging to minority groups, including national minorities and those with physical and mental disabilities. Such groups are often underrepresented. 
among identified trafficking victims and face socioeconomic inequalities that put them at a unique disadvantage. People on the move are also disproportionately impacted. Conflicts such as the war against Ukraine have pushed millions of people into positions of vulnerability, placing them at greater risk of becoming exploited. The OEC has done a lot of work to support states' anti-trafficking efforts in that context, focusing precisely on prevention. We also have a responsibility to consider the gender dynamics present within human trafficking to make sure we leave no one behind. Men and boys, women and girls are exposed to different trafficking risks because of their gender. Women and girls, for instance, represent over 90% of identified victims of trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation, while men and boys account for 68% of detected crimes, uh, detected victims of trafficking for the purpose of forced labor. Tailoring our prevention strategies to account for these patterns while not succumbing to gender stereotypes is critical in ensuring that we respond effectively to the tactics used for each form of exploitation. Moving beyond awareness raising also requires us to consider more holistic and proactive approaches to prevention that seek to take action at the source rather than only at the manifestation of the problem. Broad-based approaches and broad-based prevention strategies which addresses the vulnerabilities that exacerbate the risk of human trafficking and confront the underlying root causes for the crime have the potential to deliver meaningful and sustainable results. Tools to discourage the demand that fosters trafficking for both sexual exploitation and forced labor, as well as prevent trafficking in human beings online, are just some of the many approaches at our disposal that can help to reshape prevention. The OEC has become a leader in these areas, and the Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking Human Beings stands ready to offer further assistance to participating states in putting these policies into practice. And allow me also this opportunity to thank our special representative coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings and the team for the excellent work done, not only in preparing for this year's annual conference, but throughout the year, because their efforts matter throughout the, the year. So in conclusion, I invite you to benefit from the Alliance Conference as a unique platform to discuss how prevention strategies can be enhanced to meet the challenges of today and protect tomorrow for vulnerable groups. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Secretary General, for your remarks, and we are so grateful for your leadership in the fight to combat trafficking. Uh, your point about the, the importance of a whole of society approach uh, to combat the growing forms uh, of human trafficking and tailoring our prevention strategies uh, to address the vulnerabilities that traffickers target is so important. Thank you for those remarks. Now to the next item in our program, the OSCE Chairperson in Office, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malta, Minister Ian Borge, was unfortunately unable to join us in person, but we will have the pleasure of hearing the welcoming remarks from him over the screen. ICT, over to you. Excellencies, Madam Secretary uh, General, dear Helga, Special Representative uh, Johnston, I wish to extend my deepest gratitude for allowing me to address the 24th conference of the Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons. Trafficking in human beings remains the scourge of our time. This crime is a gross violation of human rights and poses a significant security threat to OSCE participating states and their citizens. It severely undermines the rule of law and fundamental democratic values. Trafficking is a crime that affects everyone in all societies and nations. We think of slavery as a thing of the past, a part of history. However, we live in a world where women and men, boys and girls, are still treated and traded as property, either for their labor or their bodies, 
only for the economic benefit of their trafficker. We cannot stand idle by as people continue to be violated and abused. I'm joining you today to call for a collective effort to address the root causes of these crimes and to empower those who are vulnerable in our societies so we can ensure a world free from the pain and suffering that trafficking causes people. Trafficking thrives on inequalities, poverty and discrimination. Trafficking in human beings can take place domestically, but it also transcends borders. This cannot be tackled by one participating state alone. The digital sphere, for example, has added additional complexities to the cross-border nature of this crime. The increasing impunity for perpetrators to avoid accountability also carries an immense social cost. Crisis and armed conflict further exasperate vulnerabilities on which traffickers and human beings prey. Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine is the single biggest contributor to displacements of persons in Europe today. It has pushed millions into positions of vulnerability, increasing risks of exploitation, both online and offline. I wish to reiterate the Maltese Chairperson's unequivocal commitment to ensuring that OSCE continues to mitigate the impact of this war on the people of Ukraine. Malta is proud to have made combating trafficking in persons a thematic priority for the OSCE this year. Addressing this heinous threat to our security starts with the political will that is necessary to build robust systems to both prevent and fight trafficking in human beings. We are and will continue to step up OSCE's efforts to prevent this crime. Our goal is to cultivate cooperation and motivate partners to recognize the urgency and amplify their efforts accordingly. Malta's motto for this year's Strengthening Resilience, Enhancing Security resonates deeply with the focus of this year's conference. I'm especially thankful that this year's theme is focused on prevention. Preventing trafficking in persons from happening is an important and effective way to ensure safety for all and to avoid human suffering. This year, like the last, the chair of the OSCE is prioritizing all the people of our region. We have made gender a priority theme and we are particularly motivated to combat trafficking in children as both challenges remain prevalent in the current context. I believe the OSCE is well placed to take on these challenges and help tackle these issues. With our unique comprehensive approach to security, we have the necessary tools to work across all three dimensions to combat human trafficking. We welcome this conference's focus on targeting a range of vulnerabilities. The focus on bridging gaps between factual data and effective action is necessary. In a fast-paced and rapidly changing world, our adaptation and response to new trafficking threats needs to be much faster. It is time for a thorough review of which measures work and which do not. We must be flexible and open to learn from each other's success and mistakes. Only then we can collectively move forward and implement effective prevention measures. Before I conclude, I wish to extend my sincere gratitude to Special Representative Johnson, for which enormous efforts uh, that she and her able team carry to prevent and combat human trafficking. I also wish to sincerely thank Odier for their work on trafficking in human beings over the years. Finally, I wish to recognize the support provided by other OSCE institutions and field operations. Over the next two days, we all have a great opportunity to be creative in thinking of new strategies to prevent and combat trafficking in human beings. Let's be practical and ambitious. We should assess the true impact of current policies in the OSC area and use our collective strength to develop innovative solutions. I urge you to take advantage of this discussion platform and work together to generate the political will to prevent these atrocities. Together, we can take steps towards more strategic and targeted ways of ending human trafficking once and for all. 
As the OSC Chair in Office, I am urging all participating states to act now. Thank you. Finally, let me hand over the floor for the final welcoming remarks to Director Matteo Macacci of the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, or ODIR. As part of the OSCE-wide effort to combat human trafficking, ODIR plays a critical role in this effort. Dr. Mac Director Macacci, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. And uh, really welcome to everyone uh, to this very important conference. And I'm really, truly honored to be here because this is an effort which remains a, a vital forum for all those who are working to prevent and combat human trafficking, both in the OSC region, but also beyond our region. Uh, my sincere thanks go, of course, to Minister Barge, the OSC Chair in Office, and to Dr. Carrie Johnston, uh, the OSC Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Human Trafficking, for their close cooperation and their continuous commitment to not only combat, but to prevent trafficking in human beings. I would also like to congratulate you on the theme of this year's conference, which is reshaping human trafficking prevention, which is both crucial and timely as the challenges faced by victims and potential victims evolve. For more than two decades, our collective efforts in this area have remained steadfast. ODIR from our side has developed global anti-trafficking expertise, and now plays a significant role in international victim protection, in the promotion of the rights of victims and survivors, and in addressing the vulnerabilities of at-risk groups. By basing our work on the protection of human rights, the rule of law, and non-discrimination, we promote a victim and survivor-centered, gender-sensitive, and trauma-informed approach to assisting all those impacted by human trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like at the outset to emphasize the importance of ethical survivor inclusion in all anti-trafficking efforts. Survivor leaders are professional experts who possess invaluable insight that can assist and guide the development of policies, programs, and interventions. Their lived experiences and professional expertise should support us as we strive to prevent and eradicate trafficking in human beings. To pursue this, ODIR established our leading International Survivor and Trafficking Advisory Council, or ISTAC. And I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all ISTAC members for their contribution and steadfast commitment to help all victims of human trafficking. And while we regret the recent resignation of some ISTAC members, whom I wish to thank for their contributions, I wish to reaffirm ODIR's commitment to promoting ethical survival inclusion in all our anti-trafficking efforts. In this context, we look forward to assisting and supporting OIC participating states in setting up their own National Survivor Advisory Council towards this goal. Alongside protection, prosecution, and partnership, the prevention of trafficking in human beings indeed represents a crucial component of the paradigm shift we need in order to combat this terrible crime. The importance of prevention is reflected in international law and standards, including in the OIC Plan of Action to Combat Trafficking in Human Beings and in OIC Ministerial Council decisions against human trafficking, which have been introduced at the national level through anti-trafficking laws, national, national action plans and strategies, national referral mechanisms, and social pathways. However, and it is a big however, despite all efforts to prevent human trafficking, traffickers have adapted their ways of working, whether in countries of origin, in transit, or a destination. For example, traffickers were quick to take advantage of opportunities online, using digital platforms for advertisement, recruitment, and victims' exploitation. And let there be no doubt, traffickers' methods of subjugation, psychological and physical violence, control and exploitation can lead to complex, long-term mental and physical health issues that survivors can spend a lifetime to overcome. Ladies and gentlemen, bias, prejudice, discrimination, and stigmatization related to immigration status, disability, 
and certain ethnic and cultural backgrounds can all cause vulnerability to human trafficking. However, this is often overlooked as effort focus primarily on identifying traffickers. Globally, today, fewer than 1% of trafficking victims are identified. Armed conflicts create, of course, fertile ground for human traffickers, as it has been mentioned before. And with so many people from Ukraine, which have been forced to leave their country since the attack by the Russian Federation, women and children especially face an extraordinarily difficult situation. As we have seen in previous armed conflicts where people are displaced, these groups are at a higher risk of sexual and other forms of exploitation. In its Vancouver Declaration of 2023, as well in other resolution, the OAC Parliamentary Assembly has emphasized the disproportionate impact the war has on women and children, including those with disabilities, who are considered to be at the highest risk of being lured and trafficked. We must also address the economic roots of trafficking, as it was mentioned by the special coordinator, with forced labor, labor generating an annual profit of 236 billion, according to a recent report by the International Labor Organization. But additionally, the ILO also estimates that there are 27.6 million people in forced labor on any given day, which equals to 3.5 people in every thousand. Gender is also a significant determining factor, and nearly four out of every five individuals that are trapped in these situations are girls or women. And children account for one in four of the total cases. I spoke earlier about prevention, but without a comprehensive understanding of emerging trends, underlying vulnerabilities, and the potential risks of exploitation, our work to improve prevention has a reduced impact. It is therefore all the more important for us to collect and analyze data and use it to refine prevention strategies in line with the needs of potential victims of human trafficking. In addition, OIC states must probe the root causes of trafficking more deeply, as well as addressing systemic vulnerabilities, building and establishing robust national referral mechanisms and investing in better indicators to detect victims. They also need to establish national survivor, survivor council and foster collaboration across borders and sectors, including in cyberspace, through the development of new tools and technologies that prevent distribution and help take down all online trafficking related content. At Udir, we are continuing our dedicated program of work in this area. And together with the Office of the Special Representative to Combat Trafficking in Human Beings, we have also been collecting empirical evidence, which will soon result in the publication, the publication addressing the dynamics of trafficking in persons belonging to minorities, including national minorities. We will be holding a dedicated side event to this topic tomorrow to discuss in more detail, and I invite you really to attend. In addition to this publication, ODIR is in the final stages of consultation with ISTAC and anti-trafficking stakeholders to refine our forthcoming policy guidance on survivor-informed indicators for the identification of victims and survivors of human trafficking. The implementation of a standardized set of indicators can greatly assist in improving both legislative and policy frameworks and serve as a foundation for establishing and strengthening national referral mechanism throughout the OSC region and beyond. In closing, I once again want to thank the organizers and hope that this conference will serve as a platform for further discussions and cooperation between all those who are working to prevent and address trafficking in human beings. In developing and implementing measures to prevent and combat human trafficking across our region, let us always have at the forefront of our minds the human dimension of this topic, the victims and survivors of trafficking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Makachi. We very much appreciate the cooperation between our offices that you mentioned and look forward to continuing and deepening the collaboration. 
Let us now turn our attention to our keynote addresses. We are delighted to have with us on screen Dominique Hostler, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Education and Sports of the Principality of Liechtenstein. We would have loved to have you with us here in person, but we're grateful that you're still able to join us online today. Welcome, Minister Hassler. Please, the screen is yours. Secretary General, dear Helga, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to be with you today live from Faduz. I would like to commend first the OSCE Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings, Carrie Johnston, and her team for organizing this important conference. It is indeed a great honor to speak today on a topic which has been a top priority for Liechtenstein and share with you our approaches to human trafficking prevention. I also look forward to hearing more about others' approaches. And since efficient human trafficking prevention is more important than ever, given the growing illegal profits generated through these horrendous crimes. Excellencies. Liechtenstein attaches the highest importance to the fight against modern slavery and human trafficking, including by implementing its treaty obligations and by actively contributing to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. Through the 2030 Agenda, the international community has fully committed itself to ending modern slavery and human trafficking. Liechtenstein's current presidency of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe has also committed itself towards ending this scourge. In doing so, we contribute to strengthening the Council core values, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We also see great value in the Council's group of experts on action against trafficking. This group has very recently visited Liechtenstein, and I am glad that our national administration could once again convince itself of Greta's high quality work. Excellencies, in light of Russia's heinous and ongoing war of aggression, Liechtenstein stands firmly with Ukraine. This war has led to unspeakable suffering and to increased human trafficking risks. To prevent such risks, the Office of the OSCE Special Representative and Coordinator has been providing its great relevance to OSCE participating states. The Office does so by providing valuable assistance to their efforts to prevent this scourge. Liechtenstein has thus supported the Office's reaction to the war in Ukraine at the project level from an early stage and continues to do so. Liechtenstein will also continue its political and financial support to Ukraine. And we will continue welcoming Ukrainian refugees. Currently, over 1% of our inhabitants are Ukrainian refugees. As I'm also Minister of Education, I am pleased that our education system has been able to set up so-called learn hubs for Ukrainian children with the goal to integrate them as quickly as possible into regular schooling. Another preventive national measure for the minimization of human trafficking risks in Liechtenstein pertains to the financial inclusion of Ukrainian refugees. In this regard, the three largest banks in Liechtenstein are providing refugees from Ukraine with fee-free bank accounts. Excellencies. In our global efforts to prevent human trafficking, Liechtenstein pays special attention to applying the follow the money approach. This approach is of utmost urgency given the growing amount of illegal profits that are generated each year. Sadly, the total amount of illegal profits from forced labor has risen by 37% since 2014. Given that human trafficking is a top predicate offense to money laundering, we are convinced that human trafficking can only be prevented successfully 
if the global financial sector is actively involved. But this should not just be a compliance and a due diligence issue for the sector. The sector should also help to reintegrate human trafficking survivors as clients. Unfortunately, reality is quite different. Survivors often endure financial exploitation by traffickers, be it by identified theft, the compromise of their credit histories or the use of their accounts for illegal activities. This is why, together with our financial center and philanthropic sector, we have established the Financed Against Slavery and Trafficking Initiative, in short, FAST. FAST is also addressing these barriers for survivors to access financial services. To date, FAST has managed to open almost 4,500 survivor accounts. This is a good start, while many more such accounts need to be opened. I count on your support in leveraging this important tool, which is a major driver for a survivor's agency and which will indeed help to prevent their re-exploitation. Excellencies, I greatly value the active participation of survivors in this conference. It is important that we listen to them. They will help us immensely in comprehensively assessing the various vulnerabilities new forms of trafficking as well as gaps in our prevention measures. We truly need, as we heard from Secretary General, a whole of society approach to prevention, which should be embedded in partnerships. I look now forward to hearing the perspective of others, and I am grateful for the opportunity to address this very important conference. With heartfelt greetings from Liechtenstein to Vienna, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister Hustler, for your engagement and those powerful words today. We very much appreciate your leadership and your partnership to combat human trafficking. Our second keynote will be delivered by Ugochi Daniels, Deputy Director General of our partner, the International Organization for Migration. Welcome, Deputy Director. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here on behalf of the International Organization for Migration. And like the previous speakers before me, I'm here because we at IOM see ourselves along with our partners as part of the solution and with a strong focus on how we are reshaping, reshaping our efforts. So what's at stake? Um, quite a few of the speakers before me have shared uh, the scope in terms of financial resources, have shared numbers on people. Bear with me, I have just a few more um, numbers to share. So looking at over 200,000 records from victims of trafficking, we see that Worldwide, almost two thirds are trafficked for sexual exploitation and one third are for the purposes of forced labor. And we also know from the 2022 global estimates of modern slavery that at any given day, there are 50 million people in situations of modern slavery. And that one quarter of all identified victims are trafficked as children. And we also know that last year was the deadliest year on record, claiming the lives of more than 8,500 migrants. And our data shows 65,000 people have lost their lives in the past decade, and that the number is likely much higher. So these are gruesome numbers, of course, but at the end of the day, it's about people. So I wanna talk about someone whose name is Ahmad, and I won't say, obviously I won't say where Ahmad is from, but Ahmad, like um, many young men, was seeking better opportunities and was very happy when he got a job online. 
and he traveled to the country where he got this job and he traveled regularly and legally. And when he got there, he was forced into scamming people online with a target he had to meet every day. And if he didn't meet the target, he was electrocuted. And as horrible as this situation was, Ahmed is a lucky one because Ahmed was able to get out secretly online his situation and was able to be rescued. But we see these online scam sweatshops as a new and emerging trend when it comes to trafficking. And so behind each number, let's realize it's a, it's a person. Now, we're all here because we don't want to be here five years, 10 years from now, still talking about the same thing, but at a much, at a much greater scale. And so much, much more needs to be done. So when we talk about reshaping the approach to anti-trafficking, we need to be looking at solutions, solutions that work for the countries people come from, the countries of destination where they're going to, obviously for the victims of trafficking themselves. And imagine what it takes for somebody to have more trust in a trafficker or a smuggler to put their lives in the hand of a trafficker because the trafficker is offering a very efficient business model. Because the trafficker will tell you I'm going to, um, there's, a, there's a labor market sh shortage in country X. You can get a fantastic job working as a teacher or working as a hairdresser, <clears throat> pay X amount, and I will move you and have you in your position in three weeks. And then they find when they get there, depending on the situation, it's, they end up in a situation of sexual exploitation or forced labor or worse still, modern slavery. And yet the data shows us that if we open, and when I say we, it's the collective we hear, but ultimately it's you as member states. If we were to reduce mobility restrictions, it would increase world GDP by 11 to 12%. And at the same time, reduce the protection risks of those who are seeking to move for better opportunity. And, the, and what we don't do, the traffickers are able to do very effectively because of the push and pull factors. We know the impact of conflict. We know the impact of climate. We know the impact of poverty. At the same time, we also understand the impact of labor shortages in countries of destination. We know demand for sexual slavery. So in this context, whatever we do not create, when, when we do not create opportunities for people to move safely, they will put their hands in the lives of a trafficker or a smuggler. And yes, we talk about prevention. If we are going to be, be achieving impact at the scale needed given the objectives at stake, we must be using a whole, what we in IOM call a whole of root approach, which means that discussions need to happen with the countries of origin and with the countries of destination as well as the countries of transit. Because we know that Yes, we want to address prevention and we want to look at root causes and what triggers people to move. For that to happen, it has to be within the broader development discourse. And for that to happen requires having discussion with the countries where the victims originate from. So to move forward, what have we learned? So from the IOM perspective, three things stand out. and. Um, Carrie, you spoke to some of this. 
So while public awareness raising may enhance people's ability to identify what trafficking is, it does not necessarily prevent it. Second, knowing one's rights does not automatically translate to rights being realized. For rights to be realized means we often have to address intersecting vulnerabilities and power imbalances. And third, counter trafficking interventions, especially the ones aiming to address root causes, must be incorporated in the broader development discourse. Okay, so what does this mean going forward? I like to speak about connecting the dots because the context within which trafficking is happening is multidimensional, it's multifaceted, the demand factors, the push factors at, on any aspect are all at an all time high. And so what do we need to do? So I've already spoken about engaging um, countries of origin. Matteo, you had spoken about um, engagement of the traffickers. Uh, no, we're not, no. <laughs> engagement of the victims of, of trafficking. And it's particularly important that we have systems that integrate their perspectives into counter trafficking efforts in a systematic way and not at the end. If we wait until people end up um, at borders or people end up in exploitative situations, it is already too late. Of course, having data that is reliable, that is timely, it goes without saying it's important. Mikhail, you also spoke to the need for data. Also critically important is data that is comparable. And so we're working on the what's called the International Classification Standard for Administrative Data on Trafficking in Persons. This is done through a partnership of agencies, also called as ICSTIP. We have very easy acronyms in the UN, but um, Here. and this is going to be presented to the UN Statistical Commission. And I know it sounds very geeky, but the importance of having comparable data across country, countries to look at and analyze the trends and what is happening is critical if we are going to be able to prevent along the route and even prevent before a victim of trafficking moves. Tech, innovation, um, uh, uh, technology. At the same time, it's part of the problem. It's absolutely part of the solution. And thanks to the Tech Against Trafficking program, this provides unprecedented insight into victor-perpetrator relationships, means of control and duration during trafficking, and how gender intersects. So we had heard how, I think Matteo, you had mentioned the, um, the gender dimensions. I bet what many did not do not know is that in the case of women, they are predominantly trafficked by an intimate partner. And this comes from really understanding the contours and the the, the power dynamics and what is happening in the steps of decision-making and in the process of, of being trafficked. And we know that traffickers are adapting their use of technology as quickly as, as quickly as um, tech, tech is adapting. So it's being ahead of the curb means being able to use technology working um, with the private sector, basically those that uh, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, the I don't know how many are in the room. So when I mention one, I'm told I have to mention all, but um, working with them, particularly as we are seeing more and more online scam operations. I mean, what I didn't also say in Ahmad's case is he got 5% of what he was, um, what he was enticed with as his earnings, he that's what he got as his monthly earnings. Five percent of what he was told. He was working nineteen hours, nineteen hours a day, 
And as I had mentioned, electrocuted if he didn't if he didn't meet his his targets. And we're seeing these, uh, as I said, these online scam sweatshops as a new way in which um, traffickers the traffickers are adapting their their tactics and what trafficking is done for. Okay, another dot to be connected is how we work with member states to better understand and remedy the use of passport and identity fraud that enables trafficking. Because what the data shows is that most people who were trafficked moved regularly. So how is it possible to support member states, particularly border security, to understand what to look for at their borders and what the trends are. So let me conclude by saying that there is a lot, there, there are a lot of dots to be connected. There are several partnerships, whether it's obviously, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from a UN agency within the UN that is working on different aspects of this. But most important of all is a commitment and recognition that prevention in a global context where the demand as well as the push factors are at unprecedented levels is going to require us coming up with solutions that give people better options than trusting than trusting in a, in a trafficker. So I have no doubt that over the next um, two days that the discussions are really going to unpack further the promising tools and practices from across OSCE and the region to inspire um, future action. I look forward, I don't want to abuse my welcome this first time, um, but I really look forward to also participating in discussions where the countries where traffic people come from are also represented and where in the opening, we also hear from the traffickers themselves. Because at the end of the day, this is who we are all here for and need solutions and need to come up with solutions that are sustainable and work for the countries they come from, the countries they go to, and for people who are only seeking what all of us want, and that's lives of dignity. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Director Daniels, uh, for that poignant reminder of not only the importance of data, which I agree with you strongly on, but also uh, of keeping front and center the very people uh, that this crime affects uh, the victims and survivors of human trafficking. Thank you. And with that, we will turn to our final keynote address that will be delivered by Rafael Bautista, who is a member of the United States Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. Mr. Bautista, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you guys hear me well? Um, I am here today because we are reshaping the human trafficking, and I'm the proof that is happening. Uh, my name is Rafael Bautista. I'm a current member of the United States Advisory Council on Human Trafficking, and I'm a consultant for many anti-trafficking, anti-slavery organizations. But today, I'm not speaking on behalf of, of the council or any organization. I stand before you today as a father, as a believer, as a male survivor of human trafficking. Uh, before I continue reading to you what I wrote, I would like to address some points based on the speakers that I hear in trust, is not given, it's earned. So traffickers yeah. work very hard to earn the trust of the victims and the vulnerabilities. Um, I would like to express my gratitude to the OSCE for, the, for inviting me to speak today and for the opportunity to share my insights with all of you. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the US delegation for their unwavering support and assistance. I feel privileged to be here today. Not only because I'm, not only to be here today, not only because I have survived, but because I have been given a chance at life. Something that many who experience victimization through human trafficking do not get. 
And that chance has allowed me to stand before you and on these platforms. Research has shown us that individuals who are displaced or migrating are at higher risk of being subject to human trafficking. I know there are many issues impacting the global population. There may be people in this very room that have been impacted. We have to talk about those things that make us uncomfortable, especially if we want to work for an end demand trafficking. Part of that is acknowledging that when we say nothing or when we do nothing in the face of many of these issues, we are perpetrating the same violence that was done to us in the past. Climate change and global warming are causing natural disaster, focusing thousands of people to relocate and move and <clears throat> to move from one place to another. This creates a regular and irregular migration patterns. Globally, people cannot sustain life in droughts, farming or collapsing infrastructures. It has been on human history that has taught us to migrate. We also know that socioeconomic and political devast devastations have caused displacement of many di diverse populations. The populations are being displaced due to armed conflicts, civil wars, and genocides. Th these events create various vulnerabilities for people living those experiences. Many years ago, as a minor, I left my home country looking for the dream, the American dream. The same dream has been sold to me by many like me for decades. Unfortunately, instead of a dream, I end up in a nightmare that changed me, who I am, my DNA, and how I react to everyday issues. But it does not define me. For many years, I was under the impression that I alone had decided to migrate, that I have chosen my living everything that I have known, my friends, my family, my home. Now, many years later, I understand that I did not make that decision myself as a minor, only as a minor. A boy is still need in many ways. It was the, the dysfunctional family, the absence of my father, the lack of support system, the organized crime, and the corruption of the government in my home country that caused me to leave my home. I became vulnerable to human trafficking without me knowing. Other vulnerable communities are people with disabilities, the global majority of the BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and the LGBTQ2S plus community. I will even dare to say men and boys. In that last statement, I can see your reactions from where I'm sitting. Allow me to explain why I say men and boys. It's because we have created an accept, a culture of toxic masculinity, where we do not see men as victims, only as a perpetrators. Men can be, men can be because it will then, men has been marginalized by society, has into, men are big and strong and they don't cry. Men must provide and mentally, put such a layer of responsibility on men, where it is taboo for men to ask for help. That's why there is many unreported men calling in for help. Remember, we are not born six feet tall, 180 pounds, knowing what to do. We are little boys playing soccer, barefooted in the streets with our friends. We are young men seeing our families struggle through the systemic oppression, and it is either starving or really not having food or, or shelters to provide for their families. I'm not saying that the atrocities that women have faced are not important. They are, and I am in no way positioned myself to say one is graver than the other. What I'm trying to say is that we also suffer the unspeakable. Men are just vulnerable and we are excluded from a lot of spaces because of this mentality. If we do not see men as a victims, how can we allocate funds? How do we even acknowledge the need of these services or standards of care? Who fits the, per who fits the perfect victim standard? 
If we, we look into the industries with higher risk factors of labor trafficking, we would notice that some of these are male predominant fields, such as agriculture, construction, mining, fishing. And now I'm not saying that other identified genders are not working in these sectors, but we need to understand that there are cultural norms that push men into certain jobs only. We need to unlearn what we have done in the past that has caused unintentional harm. But I will tell you today, harm is harm. And we need to do better. We need to learn what's working today and what we need to be inclusive and intentional to create equity within the anti-trafficking, anti-slavery movement. We need to include leaders from these communities and work together to create solution. We also need to compensate these experts properly because the good intentions do not pay the rent or feed my kids at home or provide for my loved ones. If we, if we want to move beyond awareness and reshape what we have done as a prevention, we need to have some uncomfortable conversations and no matter if we agree or disagree, we need to learn from each other and respect each other. The greater Mexican patriot Benito Juarez said, men are nothing, principles are everything. Respect for the rights of other is peace. Traffickers do not have principles or respect for the rights of others. Traffickers do not discriminate, do not discriminate and they will traffic anybody, like literally anybody. Your future generation is not safe. Your kids, your grandchildren, and my grandchildren are not safe if we don't act today. Traffickers keep up with technology and techniques to continue trafficking our communities. I have heard in the past the word rescue many, many times. And I will encourage you, the word rescue for support and help them remove from the circumstances. We have no superpowers. We, have, we are no heroes. We, we as, as a survivors, we need support and we need help to be able to leave that situation. Like the previous speaker mentioned, traffickers provide. If you remove me from that place that I got roof and food and you leave me in the streets, what better you did for me? What changed? Let me finish by saying language matter, respect is earned and human rights include every single person in this place called earth. No one can be free until all of us are free. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much, Mr. Bautista, for your powerful, insightful perspectives and the reminder of the urgency of the task before all of us, because indeed traffickers do not discriminate. And we have an important task before all of us. Our immediate task right now, we will transition to a coffee break. Uh, it's a little less than uh, the full half hour. We will, to keep to the schedule, we will be back here at 1600. Um, so that's a little bit more than 15 minutes. Um, and for those of you that are online, we ask that you stay online in the session because um, we will jump right back in uh, at 1600 to dive into the first panel. Um, and the coffee break will take place right here on the second floor in the cafeteria. Thank you all for your attention and thank you again to our fabulous speakers.
Ladies and gentlemen, are we, is it up? Ladies and gentlemen, are we all settled in? I wish you well. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, those who are here and those ones who are online. Welcome to our panel one. Um, as we gather here today, I'm going to be your moderator. My name is Malaiko Ringo. Uh, before I speak about myself, I wanted to acknowledge OSCE for being a strong contender for uh, survivor inclusion and engagement, and for giving survivor a plat survivors a platform to grow and also to share their, their feelings and their initiatives. Our panel today includes um, Miss Elizabeth, we're going to have Miss Miss Haba. Uh, we're going to have Miss Miss uh, Mr. M Miss Mir Mirga. Excuse for my accent. And um, we are going to have also Mr. Rizovok. Before I give them the platform, I want to introduce myself. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Malaiko Ringo. I'm an international survivor advocate, but also. I'm a founding member of Footprint to Freedom, a survivor-led organization that's worked to amplify survivor leaders' voices and also to emancipate victim voices. Besides my uh, interest in um, uh, survivor leadership, I wear many hats. I'm also um, interested very much, at, uh, I'm also passionate about survivor leadership initiatives, one of which is uh, being part of uh, coalition that amplifies survivor voices. One is Beyond Survivors, and one that is a new one is called the African Survivor Coalition that is aimed at amplifying survivor voices across Africa, apparently with scaling to 54 countries across Africa. Besides my uh, grass grassroots intervention, I've got the privilege to work with different uh, initiatives and organizations that are taking a lead in the fight against human trafficking. The UN, the UN, the the UNODC, the Salvation Army, the OSCE, and the Finance Against Human Trafficking. With that background and experience, I want to use it to share my view, not only as a, a survivor, but as a professional in this field. Our panel today will shed a light on the international and national perspective regarding vulnerabilities linked to various groups, including persons on the move, persons with disabilities, and minorities, and mainly forms of trafficking that are often overlooked. Our objectives include, uh, we are going to highlight the importance of the comprehensive understanding of the diverse vulnerabilities to ensure prevention efforts are effective and impactful, Secondly, we hope to achieve an understanding in the evolving nature of trafficking, as well as the emergence of hidden natures of underreported crimes of human trafficking. And lastly, we hope we're going to recognize the intersectionality of gender, social, economical inequalities that are contributing to the vulnerabilities of human trafficking. Before we proceed, I want to make some technical announcement. Uh, for representatives wishing to make some uh, statements, please contact our secretary at the back for questions. And um, uh, most importantly, if you're making your intervention, please let's keep them in two minutes, within two minutes, so that everyone can get a chance to talk. And um, lastly, uh, when you have questions, we are going to close our remarks when we've, we've concluded the number of people who are going to, to ask questions in, in making sure that we're keeping time. So our thinking before I introduce the speakers, I wanted also to share my views about this topic. This topic comes timely and also it's impactful, not only 
because we are rethinking to human trafficking, but also as one of the pe people who have been impacted by human trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, fellow survivors, both online and those who are here, for me, it's an honor to be here today, not only as a survivor, but as an expert and a person who is uh, a prominent leader in the fight against human trafficking. As you know, survivor leaders, before they become leaders, they face a lot of challenges and also um, discouragement before they become potential survivor leaders in the, in the fight against human trafficking. But the good news is that being here today as once a victim, uh, being able to moderate this session shows that victims do not have always to remain victims. If we support them effectively, they're able to transcend beyond their trauma to become contributors to this cause. Today, we convene to address a critical question. How do we effectively combat human trafficking? Well, acknowledging the diverse, diverse, the diverse vulnerabilities that exist within our countries, within our, our communities. With this in mind, I want us to ask ourselves, who are these people who are left behind? Who are these minorities that are, are vulnerable to human trafficking? What are the underlying factors that make them vulnerable to human trafficking? And why are they left out in the course of uh, policies and intervention? With that in mind, we are all going to be able to come up with robust solutions that meet their needs. What I'm trying to say is that when we use the word minority, it's a general concept. Under minorities, there are different forms of vulnerabilities, either from, migra from migration background, people with disabilities, those ones on the move. So we shouldn't generalize our strategies when we're combating human trafficking. In my personal experience, human trafficking is an end result of years of vulnerabilities that have been underlooked, under-resourced, and under-reported. I, from speaking from experience, when the survivor, came, sorry, when the trafficker came up, I was already a broken girl in the system that was not working. So traffic, the trafficker just took advantage of already a broken person who was ready to give in. And this is a story that is happening with so many survivors. But what is more important to recognize is that the most impacted people within our communities are the minorities. As I mentioned, if we do not improve our uh, intervention strategies to pick up also the people living on the margin, to acknowledge their existence, also not only to identify them as victims and survivors, but to tailor outreach response that is victim-centered, cultural-centered, but at the same time allocating resources that also speak into the diverse needs of different survivors. Today we've talked, I've had our first uh, uh, keynote speakers talking about uh, non-discrimination. It's a very key, important aspect. However, I want us to think, uh, I want us to remember, non-discrimination does not mean offering the same thing, to, the same response to everyone. We need to make sure that we offer tailor-made response that fits in all victims' needs. At the same time, when we think about human trafficking, as I mentioned, who is overlooked? One of the one one overlooked mi minorities that resonate with me are uh, vulner is vulnerability to rape trafficking. The recent IOM report affirmed that most survivors are at a verge of being re trafficked in the period of two years or less after exiting exploitation. What does this mean? That survivors continue to fall into the vicious circle of human trafficking if we don't put in place comprehensive support and also um, long-term support of these survivors. And also uh, we're talking about minorities, overlooked uh, um, vulnerabilities. There is also vulnerabilities that is gender related. In the recent years, all our efforts have been rightfully in the right place, supporting women and girls because they constitute 71% of the trafficked people in the world. However, we forget that men are now men, men and boys are becoming more vulnerable to human trafficking. So we need to come up with more um, gendered 
inclusive response so that we don't leave anybody behind. And most importantly, when we talk about uh, inclusion, when we come up with our effective strategies, we need to include survivors. And not only including survivors, meaningful survivor inclusion. The best way to include survivors is to make sure that we offer them capacity building so that they are able to inform our uh, strategies, our outreach programs in, in an informed way. In the recent years, what I've seen that our legitimacy to this anti-human trafficking work is our stories. But the story, our stories are not enough to make a change. We need fundings towards survivor personal development. And one call to action that has been put, put towards me from other survivors that we call upon all member states to have survivor advisory boards members to inform the national action plans. In that way, we are going to be able to get uh, outcome that resonates with the, with, the, with the target group. And remembering that um, survivors come from the marginalized groups. So when we include them, we are able to, come, to, to build fitting strategies and solutions. On that end, I'm going to open the panel. I'm going to begin with um, Ms. Vot Ms. Volterpiece. Sophia. Sophia. <laughs> yeah, they gave, yeah. Ms. Sophia. Uh, she's the Deputy Minister of Migration and, and Asylum, as well as a member of the Greek Parliament since 2004. She was the first woman to hold the position of government spokeswoman. And she's also, she had a long career as a journalist for the daily newspaper and magazine, as well as radio and television. Ms. Sophia will focus on overlooked forms of trafficking, such as exploitation in, in criminal activities, surrogacy, and illegal adop adoptions. Uh, Ms. Sophia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, dear Malaika. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, everybody, for being here. From the side of Greece, we welcome the 24th Alliance Conference Against Trafficking in Persons and thank the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which has hosted important fora on security and human rights many times. We are here, myself, myself as uh, uh, Malaika said, as a deputy minister of the Greek ministry, responsible for integration, vulnerable people, citizens, and unaccompanied minors, and uh, with um, uh, as, uh, general secretary of the ministry, uh, Mr. Heraclis, Heracles Hercules, uh, now we have the, the ancient names, who's that? Uh, Moscow who he is now the general secretary, but he for many years has uh, served as a national rapporteur on trafficking at the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <clears throat> trafficking is in the center of our interest, as in Greece, 95% of the adult victims registered in the national referral mechanism are refugees and migrants. While in regard to child victims, the percentage of children of foreign origin is nearly half of the total number. Individuals such as refugees, asylum seekers, trafficked individuals, stateless persons, irregular migrants, and other non-citizens lacking legal status, they are multiple vulnerabilities. These groups are more exposed to various risks and are indeed of special care, support, and protection. Efforts to mitigate vulnerability draw upon the norms and guidelines of international refugee and human rights laws, alongside other international legal frameworks tailored to specific national contexts. However, despite efforts and express, expressed uh, political will to combat the crime internationally, human trafficking continues to be a source of profit for criminal organizations as well as individual perpetrators with victims of every gender, nationality, and age. 
Greece has made significant progress in enhancing its response against uh, uh, human trafficking and is currently developing a robust framework for the victims' protection. First of all, all forms of exploitation are punished under the Greek criminal code, including uh, forced criminality, one of the most underreported forms, let's say, of exploitation. We are thus trying to sensitize prosecutors and police officers to investigate thoroughly the possibility of forced criminality upon arresting a minor offender. We have participated in seminars of the National Judiciary School and are designing a memorandum of agreement with the Police Department of Our Minors Protection for collabor collaboration on various levels. Specific procedural guarantees for victims are foreseen in the Greek Criminal Proceeding Code. Additional guarantees are foreseen also for child victims of human trafficking. The migrant victims are also protected from deportation and entitled to a residence permit. And of course, victims' protection is unconditional, namely not related to their cooperation with the police. In addition, the Greek national referral, referral mechanism, the main instrument, let's say, for keeping reliable statistics and coordinating all state and non-state actors, operates since 2019. The access to services is guaranteed for all victims, both presumed and formally recognized, regardless of their origin, gender, age, and most importantly, I repeat, regardless of their will to cooperate with the police. This is the most efficient, we believe, way to ensure the victim's participation in the criminal proceedings, respect respecting their rights and their trauma. Furthermore, standard operating procedures have been developed for the reception and identification service in order to identify and protect asylum seekers, victims of human trafficking, from the early stages of their arrival on the Greek, arrival on the Greek territory. The vulnerability screening serves, serves also to the direction of identifying persons at risk of uh, exploitation, thus in need of, of additional support and protection to prevent their victimization. A key pillar of, for our national inclusion strategy is the prevention of all forms of violence and trafficking. For this reason, we have included trafficking in the integration programs we implement through the European Recovery Fund with special trainings in the camps, with the participation of all ethnicities, and with an emphasis on the structures where we host Ukrainian refugees, because in Greece uh, have arrived uh, most, uh, or, uh, most, mostly women with uh, children, and we have a special camp in LFCs, uh, in El ancient city of LFCs, uh, where the women and the children live, uh, uh, Ukrainian women and children. At the same time, every two years, we carry out large international exercise Medusa with important particip participation from Greece and abroad. It is worth mentioning that for this year's exercise, we are planning to include more than 500 people in the field, field in more than 70 locations inside and outside Greece, including recognized refugees and asylum seekers from 12 camps. The exercise command team consists of more than 130 senior officers from all the Greek national authorities. Uh, our ministry has also developed uh, a national strategy regarding the protection of unaccompanied uh, minors. An exemplary promising practice of our ministry in particular is the national emergency response mechanism for unaccompanied minors, which aims to act proact proactively to prevent unaccompanied children from being trafficked for sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, 
post criminality radicalization as well as to provide support and protection to children victims of trafficking. This mechanism, the NERB, was established in 2021 with the support of UNHR and proactively traces and identifies unaccompanied children in need or at risk, including child victims of trafficking, ensuring immediate intervention and protection. In order to reach its target population, NERV has put in place a procedure which relies upon the close cooperation between the state, international organization, namely IOM and UNHR, and civil society organizations. The mechanism comprises three main components, the tracing telephone line, the mobile units uh, which conduct to street work, and uh, the, the, the uh, emergency accommodation facilities which are operated by IOM. Uh, NERM stands at a preventive measure against trafficking by offering protection to a largely undetected population. And uh, of course, I must say that uh, recently, last year, last December, uh, the mechanism uh, got the second European prize against uh, criminality. And uh, uh, we, we tried to give help and we gave help to more than 8,000 persons. Uh, particularly uh, unaccompanied minors who are not, uh, I mean, they are 16, 17 years old, so are not mm -hmm. minors. The idea of minors we have, they arrive uh, in Greece uh, at, at the age of 15, 16, 17 years old. Uh, in the last years, we have uh, uh, girls from Africa also. Before, we had uh, boys from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia. And we tried to not to have them in the streets because uh, um, the organized crime uh, likes to have uh, young boys and girls in the street, take them and uh, 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 weaponize them uh, against the society and against, them, them, against themselves. So what we believe for us, because we are a first reception country, is that we must be there when every boat, boat arrives together with the Coast Guard to find out who are the unaccompanied minors or who are the women that they look like uh, they look like they are vulnerable because sometimes uh, they arrive a man and a woman and the man says this is my wife and after a while we find out that she was not a wife and she was exploiting her so what we try to do is to give education on trafficking to our interpreters because they are the first that talk to these people and so they can understand if they are okay they are well educated on the trafficking traces and of course, uh, for, for the labor, what we've done is that last uh, December, we passed a law uh, because we have a lot of people that their, uh, their asylum is rejected. So we, we passed a law and gave permit to stay in Greece to all foreign people uh, that were in Greece for the past three years and they bring contract with the, the employer. So in order to combat, you know, the black money um, exploitation on labor. So I have to finish. If uh, there are any questions after, you can ask me and please feel free to ask Mr. Morskov also, who is our guru for trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sophia, for uh, those insights. Uh, Actually, speaking of 95% uh, of people who are being trafficked in, 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 in your area being migrants, underscores our urgent need to really uh, look for interventions that support migrants. But what resonates with me very well is the trauma-informed approach that you're working with the law enforcement to make sure that victims are not re-trafficked, but also uh, thinking about the minors uh, because this is the changing um, approach that we've been wishing to see, that young victims are, are taken seriously and they are supported at, at their immediate time. 
Thank you for your remarks. Secondly, um, our second panelist is Ms. Tan, near me here. Um, she's the director of the Division of the International Protection at the Geneva headquarters of the, of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. She joined UNHCR in 1995 and held numerous positions in protection, policy, and management, including in Burundi, Egypt, Sri Lanka, and in Sudan. Ms. Stan will provide insight into the prevention efforts uh, for people on, on the move in the context of displacement and conflicts. Uh, she will also tell us more about the importance of addressing the intersectionality of vulnerabilities in prevention approaches. Ms. Stan. Thank you, Malaika and uh, Madam Chairperson, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it's my pleasure to be here today to offer a few insights uh, and perspectives from UNHCR on prevention of trafficking in persons. So we've heard from some of the other speakers already today that displacement exacerbates trafficking risks and compounds existing vulnerabilities of people that are forced to flee. So in times of crisis and conflict, when people are forced to flee from their homes, whether they're internally displaced or whether they cross international borders, they find themselves in vulnerable situations exposed to a variety of risks that affect their safety and well-being, including potentially human trafficking. With record displacement worldwide, um, by mid last year, we were at 110 million uh, persons forcibly displaced worldwide. We're seeing increased numbers of forced displacement and stateless people who are in precarious situations. Individuals who are displaced within their own country, internally displaced because of war, conflict, violence, persecution, find themselves often discriminated against and excluded from essential services, and they do not have, um, they have restricted access to livelihoods and to education, to health, and the means to be full members of society. They often wait for years, for decades, for a solution to their situation of displacement. Without solutions in sight, and with risks of abuse and exploitation exacerbating over time, some of these individuals are tricked or trapped into sexual exploitation, domestic servitude, forced labor, on farms, in artisanal mines, or in construction sectors. The Global Protection Cluster that works with internally displaced in emergencies, in 2023 data found that 52% of the 29 countries that they survey, surveyed had a medium to very high risk of women and girls but also other overlooked groups like boys, men, persons with disability, older persons being at risk of trafficking. Sometimes people cannot find safety within their own country and they cross an international border seeking asylum in a neighboring country. It's in those border areas and camps where people fleeing Await, await opportunities to, re to reach safety, especially in remote areas that lack services and protection. That's where smuggling and trafficking thrives. Evidence shows that in contexts of restrictive border and asylum policies, and in the absence of safe routes to, for admission to, for, to seek protection, refugees may often have no other option than entrusting their lives to smugglers with all the risks that this entails, as well as the possibility that those smuggling situations turn into trafficking. 
We've seen in the context of Europe with the Ukraine refugee emergency that activating protection uh, uh, protection early, in the case of Europe, the EU Temporary Protection Directive, as well as the dedicated multi-stakeholder and anti-trafficking plan has helped mitigate the risks that refugees face. In particular, not having to hide, not having to engage a smuggler to cross borders, being able to move to a country where you have family, where you have community support, is what is has been for those individuals the biggest protection against trafficking. We need to see more of these good examples where refugees are protected through international cooperation, through cooperation within the European Union in this case, to prevent trafficking and to have better protection for refugees and asylum seekers. We know that in refugee camps and urban settings where refugees reside, trafficking risks increase over time when people do not have access to livelihoods, to healthcare, to education, to opportunities to reunify with their families. These kinds of things push children into the arms, into the hands of smugglers and expose them to the risks of trafficking, as we have heard from the deputy minister in Greece. Forced displacement, then, is certainly a risk factor for trafficking. At the same time, we must take an intersectional approach. Not all refugees are the same. We know that victimization and targets of trafficking cut across different sectors of the community. We need to take an intersectional intersectional approach to ensure that we understand the risks that individuals face. Trafficking cuts across different ages, genders, diversity characteristics, but it takes into, a, into account a whole situation, the specific circumstances, the protective factors, the coping mechanisms, but also the agency of people. Where refugees don't find protection, where they don't find access to education, to livelihoods, to a dignified way of life, they may move on. This is where trafficking risks are high. Mixed movements of refugees and other migrants of them on the move are places that are rife for traffickers. They're seeking individuals who are desperate, who are in need of alternatives. I wanted to build on some of the remarks of the IOM Deputy DG uh, Daniels, who talked about a whole of journey approach, a route-based approach. This, this would entail taking both an approach in countries of origin, countries of asylum, countries along the route that people are moving, but also a comprehensive approach. Humanitarian assistance in large um, emergencies needs to be present, needs to go beyond one year of emergency. People unfortunately do not find solutions quickly, and oftentimes are in displacement in refugee camps for decades. Support needs to start there. Support needs to start certainly with political solutions to allow people to go home. By humanitarian assistance, development assistance, assistance to governments who are trying to manage large numbers of asylum seekers and migrants is essential beyond the OECD countries. So that whole of journey and comprehensive approach 
is the only way that we will find opportunities to really address the risk of trafficking. We need to invest in solutions. We need to take measures to increase access to protection and support all along the routes. In conclusion then, when forcibly displaced have access to safety, rights, and opportunities, when solutions are real, they become people become more resilient and self-reliant. As a result, traffickers are less able to capitalize on their precarious situations and exploit them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tan, for those remarks and for making us uh, think beyond um, the after effects of human trafficking, but also looking at uh, intervention that looks at before it happens. But one thing that I uh, I liked very much, um, not being political, but also to think about what did we learn with from the Ukraine intervention, the proactiveness, the stakeholder um, approach and everyone working together uh, to some extent as, as really raising uh, protection among U Ukrainian refugees. So we might we, we should use those as best practices to apply them to future occurrences that should come, come up. Thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist is Ms. Hebe uh, from Egypt. She was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council as a special reporter on the rights of persons with disabilities from the 1st of November, 2023. She's an advocate, an international disability consultant, and a researcher on the rights of persons with disabilities with an extensive experience in Egypt, the Arab region, and worldwide. Uh, Ms. Heb is will provide an overview of different types of disabilities uh, as vulnerabilities to human trafficking and how well states are including these diverse vulnerabilities into their prevention efforts. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. For, thank you, Malaika. Uh, good evening. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by conveying my profound gratitude to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, for their exceptional and unwavering effort in combating the insidious crime of human trafficking, which remains a pervasive issue affecting all segments of our societies. I express my thanks for their dedication to ensuring that their effort in combating these crimes are inclusive across all categories and sections, leaving no one behind. I also offer my appreciation for their consistent organization of this esteemed global conference over the past 24 years, serving as a cornerstone for collaboration and knowledge exchange in the realm of combating human trafficking. Despite the significant scarcity of detailed data regarding disabilities and human trafficking with which undoubtedly reflects on the sensitivity of national preventative strategies against human trafficking, particularly concerning the trafficking and the protection of persons with disability from such a crime. Women and children with disabilities still face unique challenges and heightened risk in the context of human trafficking, especially during um, conflict and chaos in different instances. Necessitating targeted intervention and specialized protection measures to safeguard their rights and well-being effectively, especially when persons with disabilities are in poverty, it makes them more vulnerable to being pushed in forced begging trafficking and abuse and 
when protection policies lack disability, uh, when protection protection policies lacks disability perspective. The UN Convention Against Trans Transnational Organization Crime Supplementary Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking in Person, Especially Women and Children, the Palermo Protocol, in its preamble, emphasizes the obligation of states to take, con to take effective measures to prevent and combat human trafficking, especially concerning women and children. This necessitates adopting a comprehensive international approach in countries of origin, transit, and destination, incl including measures to prevent trafficking, prosecute traffickers, and protect victims through, throughout means such as safeguarding their international recognized human rights which use particular attention to the vulnerabilities of women and children with disabilities. Trafficking risks for women with disabilities and online violence needs to be addressed with tailored prevention strategies and accessible awareness campaigns nationwide. Furthermore, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities came to protect individuals with disabilities from different types of discrimination, exploitation, violation, to ensure their human dignity and provide justice from abuse of the victims, especially women and girls with disability, as stated in its preamble, in Article 3 and Article 5, Article 11, and mostly in Article 16, where it obligates the state's parties to make all appropriate measures to promote the physical, cognitive, psychological recovery, rehabilitation, and social reintegration of persons with disability who became becomes victim of any form of exploitation, violence, or abuse, including through the provision of protect, protection services. Although both conventions are well covering different categories of persons and uh, uh, people with disabilities inside these conventions, the implementation at the national level is not very efficient. In light of the aforementioned, it has become vital to address the question, how should countries consider the diversity of disability when formulating preventative strategies against human trafficking? Strategies, laws, and policies should be sensitized to the different categories who are targeted of uh, who are targets of trafficking especially persons with disabilities the inclusion of women and children with disabilities in the discourse of human trafficking prevention strategy is vital their voices and experience should be heard when developing these strategies therefore when formulating anti trafficking measures countries must consider diverse range of disabilities to ensure that no individual is overlooked or marginalized in these efforts. Tailored initiatives and support systems should be part of uh, put in place to address the special vulnerabilities and challenges faced by women and children with disability, recognizing their unique need and ensuring their comprehensive protection and exploitative practices and forced labor and their trafficking. When elaborating in this crucial matter, it is essential to delve into three level, levels stipulated in the Palermo Protocol for combating human trafficking, prevention at the first level, punishment of traffickers at the second level, and protection of trafficking victims on the third level. It is imperative to in integrate disability inclusive perspective at each level, promoting disability rights, 
including ratification of the UN Convention Against uh, Transnational Organized Crimes. Uh, actually, for more details, I, I think you should be able to attend our side event tomorrow where we are going to talk about more details in this area because I only have one minute to finish and I thank you all for your attendance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Eva, for reminding us about uh, our potential side, ev side events tomorrow. We are going to expand on most of these topics. Um, and uh, maybe to just add on what she said um, that resonates with me is that we've been, we moved from including a specific type of uh, survivors or this, uh, specific people when it comes to policy intervention. But what we should look for or what we should look at that in order for us to be comprehensive, there should be a diversity of inclusion. As she says that there's multiple layers of vulnerabilities under a, the minority group. So for example, if, um, if you include uh, survivors and then you include um, somebody with one set of disability or one from a particular, particular country, they do not bring the whole spectrum of inclusion. So let's try to include uh, minorities in a more uh, comprehensive and a diverse way. Um, running to my next panelist, uh, Ms. Mirga. Um, she is a cultural aminator, political scientist, and a researcher. She has nearly 15 years of experience working in government administration in the areas of state policies towards eth ethnic and national man minorities, and in coordinating integration policies towards Roma and Poland. She is the author of several scientific articles in Rome, in Roma, issues and uh, evaluation report for the European institution. Uh, Ms. Ms. Milga, she will provide an insight, insights on the current and human trafficking prevention efforts uh, to address trafficking of persons belonging to national mi minorities, in particular Roma and in Sint. She will tell us more about the intersectionality between trafficking and discrimination based on race, ethnicity, and including a situation of conflicts and humanitarian crisis. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, I would like to thank um, the organizers for the invitation to contribute uh, to this important event. Today, I stand before you to shed light on the critical issue um, often overlooked uh, in discussions on human uh, trafficking, the intersection of gender, race, ethnicity, and its impact uh, on the vulner vulnerability of minority individuals. In particular, I will focus uh, on Roma communities who have historically been often the victims of various forms of uh, oppression. Um, Roma constitute the single largest ethnic minority group in Europe with, the esti with an estimated population 10, 12 million. Their level of poverty and social exclusion remains high across the OSC region, uh, resulting in higher level of vulner vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability. For instance, the European Union strategy towards the eradication uh, of trafficking, trafficking in human beings 2012-2016 defines Roma as a vulnerable group at greater risk of human trafficking. In the 2019 Trafficking in Person report, Roma were mentioned as a vulnerable group in 29 of 57 OSCE participating states. Uh, trafficking in human rights being, uh, beings is often on, analyzed from a perspective that emphasizes gender, overlooking the impact of discrimination based on race and ethnicity. Marginalization, stigmatization, and disempowerment coupled with limited access to essential services, education, job opportunities, significant, significantly contribute to the um, Vulnerable, vulnerability of these individuals to human trafficking. In this regard, 
I welcome the upcoming OSC publication on addressing uh, the dynamics of trafficking in persons belonging to minorities and their effort to shed light on this inter intersectionality that increases the risk of trafficking. The Roma community often relegated to segregated settlements is at risk of human trafficking for two main reasons. Firstly, it is isolated um, uh, from the majority population through social ex exclusion and negative stereotyping. And secondly, there is a lack of integration into anti-trafficking initiatives within the broader social support services, such as health and education, where prevention measures may be effective. Romani women and children are largely overrepresented as victims regardless of the purpose of the um, of the of trafficking it is however very difficult to establish a precise extent of trafficking in roma communities few roma are identified by police as a traffic person but rather as criminals many are reluctant to self identify and approach um, low um, enforcement agencies for fear of um, reprisal from traffickers or of prosecution for the conduct of criminal acts. The fourth status uh, report, implementation of the action plan on improving the situation of Rama and Sinti within the OSC area, published by OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, reveals that Rama and Sinti women are highly su uh, susceptible to various forms of uh, discrimination when they are victims of crime. This includes instances of domestic violence where police fail to act as well as situation where uh, traffic Roma and Sinti women receive no protection and are instead misclassified as irregular migrants. Roma women living with disabil disabilities along with the elderly and young encounter significant barriers in finding shelter and accessing essential services. They report experiencing multiple layers of discrimination and violence and are particularly vulnerable to human trafficking, including sex and labor trafficking, especially in the context of um, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, during the Roma Women's Consultation in Warsaw, um, Roma Women's Consultation meeting organized by OSC Odir in 2002, I, I took part, I was confronted with alarming statistics revealing that nearly half, 48% uh, uh, to be precise, of the victims identified within trafficked Roma communities in Romania are children. This distressing figure sheds light on the grave reality this young life faced, sexual exploitation, involvement in petty crimes, forced begging and labor. What amplifies the gravity of the situation is the systemic oversight by those in position of authority. Double discrimination based on ethnicity and gender, but also age against Roma girls and women adds to their vulnerability, vulnerability uh, to trafficking. Roma children are often overlooked by law enforcement and social services. This authorities mistake, mistakenly dismiss this, uh, such instance, instances as mere extension of traditional cultural practices and custom. This misinterpretation often leads to a significant under-reporting and under-investigation of potential trafficking scenarios effectively leaving these vulnerable children without the protection and support that they um, and support they desperately need lack of oversight not only hampers the fight against human trafficking but also perpetuates a, a cycle of neglect and abuse it underscores a critical need for a shift in perception among those tasked with safeguarding our communities. Training and awareness raising efforts are urgently required to ensure that all children, regardless of their ethnic and cultural background, receive equal protection under the law and are recognized as potential victims of trafficking deserving of uh, deserving of true investigation and care. And to conclude, I would like to highlight a couple of recommendations following the Roma Women Consultation in 2022 in Warsaw. Participating states should conduct specialized training for police, social workers, 
and educators on the dangers as, uh, associated with human trafficking. All actors, including civil society organizations, should also engage Roma and Sinti men and boys in community-based efforts to promote gender uh, equality. Only through inclusive and non-discriminating prevention strategies that take into account the intersectionality of vulnerabilities, we will be able to combat trafficking of persons belonging to minorities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for those deliberations. And uh, thank you bringing that to attention, the issue of social exclusion, especially for mag marginalized groups. And also uh, what has what has been continuously being addressed is the burden that is left for victims to self-identify, which is still the on ongoing issues, which I think we need still to address. And um, our next speaker, the last one, where is my paper? Samir 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 Thank you, Lady Moderator. Your Excellencies, Honorable Special Representative and Coordinator, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to congratulate Ms. Johnson on her appointment and wish her success in future work. It is my great pleasure uh, to present the experience of Bosnia-Herzegovina in targeting vulnerability as well as diverse forms of trafficking, including those forms that are often overlooked especially trafficking for the purpose of forced criminality and forced uh, begging that we gained in the last years. Uh, the two forms that are not specifically defined as forms of exploitation in the Palermo Protocol and Council of uh, Europe uh, Convention, despite that a long ago we all could uh, read and watch uh, books and movies like uh, Oliver Twist and the similar, where such kind of the trafficking was very well uh, present. And also kind of the trafficking where the victims are uh, almost exclusively uh, vulnerable groups from the uh, minority groups, from the minors, and also uh, persons with the, the disabilities. At the beginning of the development of our anti-trafficking response against forced criminality and forced begging as forms of trafficking, we were fully aware that we have to have a comprehensive understanding of the diverse vulnerabilities within the groups involved in such forms of trafficking, especially among professionals in law enforcement, prosecution, and judiciary. This includes recognizing the intersectionality of gender, social, and economic inequalities that contribute to trafficking crimes, understanding how traffickers exploit these uh, vulnerabilities, and acknowledging the prevalence for forced criminality and forced uh, begging. In our actions, we have been facing challenges in the different uh, in the uh, effective prosecution of those two forms, due to the fact that during alignment of domestic legislation with Palermo Protocol and Council of Europe Convention, we did not introduce in the definition of trafficking, forced criminality, and forced begging as force of uh, exploitation. Uh, we have to convince our professionals that forced criminality and forced begging are form of forced labor or services and sometimes practices similar to slavery. Factors indicative of the criminal offense of trafficking were not recognized of or uh, qualified as uh, such. In case of the exploitation of underage victims by uh, forcing them into begging or committing petty crimes, the defendants regularly were charged and uh, convicted on the much lesser crime of neglect or uh, maltreatment of a child or juvenile for which received a suspended sentence or uh, imprisonment with probation. Uh, 
Some years ago, we witnessed failures uh, to effectively investigate all relevant circumstances of such cases. This includes investigating the true nature of the relationship between defendant and the victim, following obvious lines of inquiry to gather evidence and avoiding over-reliance of the victim's testimony. As well, we observed several cases in which criminal justice authorities failed to either investigate all relevant circumstances of the case or to expand the investigation against the alleged traffickers. In child begging case, it was regularly observed a lack of genuine efforts to investigate the true nature of the circumstances behind the case. For instance, whether it is a case of a lack of parental care or rather the economic exploitation of children by their parents or guardians. Because of this, the prosecutors and the courts often fail to properly qualify the defendant's uh, conduct uh, as, a, as, a, as a trafficking. Uh, the light treatment of child begging cases has resulted in the cases of child begging being prosecuted under the criminal offense of neglect or maltreating a child or juvenile, despite the prima facie presence of elements of human trafficking. In many cases, the evidences indicated that, that defendants had exploited underage children, sometimes their own, for forced uh, begging. Uh, also, we were aware that the failure to properly qualify criminal conduct undermines the principle of legal certainty, which should guarantee consistency in factuality, similar situations, and contribute to public confidence in the legal system. As the European Court of Human Rights remarks, the, uh, the persistence of divergent judicial practice can, cre can create a state of legal uncertainty likely to reduce public confidence in the judicial system, whereas uh, such confidence is clearly one of the essential component of the state based on the rule of uh, law. Because of all of that, we had created strategic measures to ensure that trafficking in, uh, is uh, treated uniformly throughout the country and that uh, wherever the, necessity and the necessary elements of trafficking exist, the case must be prosecuted and adjudicated as a trafficking uh, offense. After a years of the implementation of the strategic measures designed to suppress trafficking for the purpose of forced begging and forced criminality, uh, especially law enforcement and judiciary capacity building measures, we can notice that entire, uh, that entire awareness and approach toward forced begging and forced criminality has been changed. Instead, failures to investigate, instead improper qualifications, instead acquittals of the cases with the justification that such forms of exploitation of children are part of the tradition of the some minority uh, groups, uh, part of the customs, part of their culture. Now recently we are witnessing convictions of trafficking who exploited victims of trafficking for the purpose of forced criminality and forced uh, begging. In this uh, uh, regard, we also uh, can notice the changes of the culture of uh, our uh, society because uh, uh, before the legal uh, the, the forced begging and the forced criminality were considered as a socially acceptable uh, behavior as a part of the culture or the tradition of the some minority groups now we uh, have changed uh, even uh, the culture of uh, our society and now forced criminality and forced begging are not anymore socially acceptable and the society uh, is reacting or any uh, uh, possible case that can be considered as a trafficking for the forced uh, labor. Uh, also, uh, our jurisprudence so far can witness that we succeeded in the changing of the culture and changing of the entire uh, approach towards uh, those two forms of the uh, trafficking uh, who uh, were overlooked in uh, international documents, but also overlooked in the, our uh, national uh, legislation, that forced criminality and the forced begging is uh, not uh, a, a necessity of the certain uh, group of the people, but uh, there are also few, uh, some cases that are the, the necessity uh, of the uh, certain families or groups, but that the majority of the such cases are actually the organized uh, criminal uh, criminal uh, activities. Uh, our jurisprudence in the last uh, years uh, have uh, more example of the successful investigation, and we also have 
the uh, convictions for the both kinds of criminality and the force begging and the force criminality where uh, organized criminal groups, for example, in one uh, case were sentenced for the 74 years of uh, imprisonment for the uh, force begging while for the force criminality the conviction, conviction uh, was in total of 33 uh, years for organized criminal uh, criminal group. Uh, this case uh, of the forced criminality trafficking in human beings also was a transnational uh, case where uh, the group of the young uh, women and uh, children were uh, recruited for the uh, pickpocketing in the uh, one of the countries of the European Union and uh, where the, the uh, in financial investigation uh, showed that uh, around 2 million euros of illegal proceedings were uh, only transferred from uh, uh, from France to Bosnia-Herzegovina, where was the uh, seat of the uh, organized, organized uh, criminal groups. So, uh, to conclude, uh, if we uh, effectively implement targeted and uh, impactful prevention strategies against human trafficking and develop comprehensive understanding of the diverse vulnerabilities within the human trafficking landscape, particularly those that are often overlooked in anti-trafficking responses, it is possible to make progress and even make cultural changes in uh, that uh, regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shamil. Thank you for highlighting the importance of uh, society behavior shifts. Uh, it's very important if the communities do change their perception about exploitation, it also helps in the way uh, victims are integrated. Um, this was our panelists. The next phase, is we're going to go for uh, interventions. Um, our first intervention is going to be given to the Bel Belgium on behalf of EU. And uh, that is going to be followed by Slovakia, so Slovenia, and then later the United States. So, Ambassador, the floor is yours. And um, some remarks. Let's keep it within the two minutes because we have so many statements from different states. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Avec votre autorisation, je passe la parole à la délégation de l'Union européenne. Madam Moderator, the European Union and its member states are pleased to take part in the 24th edition of the High Level Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons Conference. We would like to take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to the Office of a Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings for organizing this conference, and thanks a lot to all the panelists. This year's Alliance Conference will sadly be the third one since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Since then, but also after years of Russian aggression against Ukraine, millions of Ukrainians have been forced to flee Russia's war of aggression, with around 6 million of them finding shelter in Europe. An overwhelming majority of these refugees are women and children, who are especially at risk of being trafficked. While Ukraine was already a predominant country of origin for victims of trafficking in the European Union, Russia's war of aggression has significantly increased opportunities for traffickers to exploit the vulnerable situation of people fleeing Russia's war. Against this backdrop, the European Union reacted swiftly and the risk of human trafficking was addressed with the required seriousness from the outset. The common anti-trafficking plan with concrete action at EU level and recommendations for member states was set up by the EU anti-trafficking coordinator to prevent human trafficking, increase law enforcement and judicial cooperation, and protect victims. While the EU's efforts have helped to reduce vulnerabilities, preventing the exploitation of further victims remains paramount. In this context, we welcome the emphasis of the 24th Alliance Conference on advancing human trafficking prevention beyond awareness raising. We share the approach of the Office of a Special Representative of the whole of society approach to prevention and to recognize the potential for more impactful and innovative measures. This is also the approach followed by the European Union. 
The EU thanks the speakers of the opening session and the first panel for initiating discussions and stressing the importance of robust preventive measures and identifying opportunities to improve prevention efforts. In the EU, 63% of registered victims are women and girls, and 15% of victims are children. In the current context, it is crucial to focus our efforts on analyzing the trends and root causes for, for exploitation, identifying vulnerabilities at risk of being exploited by traffickers, and addressing the needs of vulnerable groups, including women and children, but also refugees, persons belonging to minorities, and persons with disabilities. To contribute to the discussion, we are pleased to announce the recent agreement on updating EU traffic, anti-trafficking directive. It will ensure that the EU and its member states are better equipped to address current challenges and trends with a dual focus on prevention and enforcement. The new rules broaden the scope of the legislation to cover additional purposes of human trafficking, such as exploitation of surrogacy, forced marriage, and illegal adoption. To respond to the challenge posed by the increasing use of online platforms and social media by traffickers, the dissemination of exploitative material of sexual nature through the internet and social media will become an aggravating circumstance, leading to higher penalties. The directive will also address prevention through demand reduction and criminalize the knowing use of services exploited from trafficked persons. Mandatory EU-wide annual data collection will also allow for more targeted anti-trafficking efforts. In addition, the revision will require the formal establishment of referral mechanisms and improve overall national governance structures. The review of the directive was also a key action of the EU strategy on combating trafficking in human beings, which addresses prevention, protection and empowerment of victims and prosecution of perpetrators with a focus on discouraging demand and breaking the criminal model of traffickers, including online. We look forward to continuing our discussions on countering trafficking in human beings during the Alliance Conference and hope that this outcome will inspire all of us to pursue and improve our efforts to fight this crime. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Ambassador. Now I give the floor to the State Secretary of Slovenia, followed by the United States and United Kingdom. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you for giving me the floor, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to thank the OACC for organizing this event. Preventing action is of key importance in combating trafficking in human beings, as it can stop trafficking before it even begins. I would like to highlight that all activities in the field of combating trafficking in human beings in Slovenia, including prevention, are based on two-year action plans adopted by the government. The government is constantly reviewing the legislation and other anti-trafficking measures to improve the fight. This is also reflected in action plans, which are being regularly upgraded with new measures adopted to new trends and challenges in this field. In terms of awareness arising among vulnerable groups, special attention has been to paid to children and youth as well as the Roma community. In 2021, the Ministry of Interior introduced a systematic and long-term awareness-raising approach by carrying out workshops in all primary and high schools in the region in Slovenia. Another group extremely vulnerable to exploitation consisting of migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced persons, Slovenia, like the rest of the European Union, has been dealing with a disproportionate number of people applying for international protection in recent years. In the current situation, the Slovenian government has recognized the importance of a comprehensive approach to migration management which is why the migration and integration strategies have been recently adopted. The new migration strategy strives to ensure safer migration routes and effective asylum procedures while respecting fundamental ri human rights and freedoms and protecting vulnerable groups. At the same time, it also addresses the needs of the economy and the employment of foreigners and more effective control over the employment of foreign workers. 
continuous awareness raising among migrants about their rights and works with employers to create decent working condition is also an essential part of prevention. In this regard, I would like to mention the project within live exhibits exploited workers were placed in human size sales packages which were displayed in the main streets in order to raise employers' awareness of human trafficking, the project has also produced a digital advertising catalog with different profiles of the most frequently exploited work workers, which has been distributed to more than 200 companies in Slovenia. All these measures are a sign of the government's continuous efforts to combat trafficking in human beings, but there is always room to improvement and need to do more. In the future, we will also have to strengthen our activities among other vulnerable groups to which we have perhaps not paid enough attention so far. I'm convinced that this conference will provide us with some new idea. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your remarks. Um, the, the next floor goes to uh, the United States Ambassador at large, followed with uh, uh, France. Um, so, sorry, so it's forward with the UK. Um, the ambassador large, the floor is yours. The United States uh, really thanks the panelists and moderator for this informative discussion. Victims of trafficking in the online scam industry may be overlooked because these victims may not fit the expected profile of a trafficking victim. These victims are often highly educated and multilingual. They have marketable skills in technology and communications, and it is these very skills which made them a target of traffickers. This is important in this venue because online scam operations were originally based mainly in Southeast Asia, but recently they have been identified in the OSCE region in Ukraine, Turkey, Russia, and Georgia. These scam operators exploit individuals from around the world, including some from OSCE participating states. In response to this growing threat, on the prevention front, we recommend that participating states increase awareness raising among vulnerable communities, including through targeted information campaigns and pre-departure trainings for those migrating for work abroad. One method used by the United States is the Know Your Rights pamphlet, which is provided to non-immigrant visa holders in certain employment and education-based categories. This pamphlet informs uh, individuals of their rights in the United States and alerts them about the National Human Trafficking Hotline and other resources in case things go wrong. We also recommend increased efforts to train border officials on how to proactively detect potential victims of forced labor in online scam operations, especially given the unusual demographic characteristics of some of those victims. I would now like to pass the floor to my colleague, Mr. Batista. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to emphasize the vulnerability of undocumented immigrants who are often expected to be providers for their loved ones back home. Many resources are created exclusively for survivors of sex trafficking and not for labor trafficking survivors. Most of them are created for uh, women and, and minors. The US government, Know Your Right Brochures, is a great tool to educate and prevent human trafficking. And I encourage everyone to create one of those and pass it around to every person who is entering your region or your uh, territory. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Um, the next floor is going to be given to United Kingdom, modern day, modern day slavery convoy, and followed with France. Well, thank you, uh, moderator, and uh, and also to the panelists for their insightful uh, presentations today. 
Um, the United Kingdom recognizes that prevention is the absolute cornerstone of an effective response to modern slavery and human trafficking. As we heard uh, from our panel this afternoon, it's clear that crises, whether man-made, such as that caused by Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, or those caused by natural disasters or by climate change, exacerbate the risk of modern slavery and human trafficking taking place. We've heard during this session about the challenges faced by individual people in vulnerable circumstances, including women and children. But not only, and I commend Mr. Bautista's uh, uh, intervention in the previous session on that point. Now, over the past 10 years, uh, the United Kingdom's flagship modern slavery program, Working Freedom, has striven to prevent uh, the trafficking of women and girls across migration pathways. This has helped to generate a valuable body of evidence on how to address the drivers of exploitation, which, in, which we are now sharing with the international community, including uh, in the OSCE region. It's vital that OSC participating states continue to work together both bilaterally, and I'm pleased to see several of our valued bilateral partners here today, and multilaterally, and with civil society, including Alliance 8.7, and the new Global Commission on Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking. By harnessing these partnerships, we can further develop the evidence base on what kinds of approaches work to prevent modern slavery and human trafficking. Central to this is ensuring that the voices of survivors and affected communities are closely involved. And it is for this reason that the United Kingdom, on the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, pledged to support survivor-led organizations and civil society working to end modern slavery in our funding to international programs. Finally, uh, I'd like to thank you, Special Representative, uh, for your uh, international leadership and the pivotal role your office has played in understanding vulnerability and shining a light on emerging and overlooked forms of trafficking. This is something uh, we must all be alive to. Thank you. Thank you. Now the, the next floor goes to France. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. <coughs> Pardon. Euh, la France, bien évidemment, s'aligne sur la, la déclaration de l'Union européenne, mais je voudrais ajouter quelques, quelques mots en ma capacité nationale. D'abord, évidemment, pour euh, ajouter ma voix euh, à tous les remerciements qui vous ont, ont été euh, formulés, à vous, Madame la représentante spéciale, et, et à tous les précédents intervenants. Et je voudrais, à mon tour, euh, souligner en particulier les témoignages euh, à la fois très forts et, et très instructifs euh, de Monsieur Baptiste et de vous-même, Madame Malaika Oringo. Merci beaucoup pour cela. La France est pleinement engagée dans la lutte contre la traite des êtres humains, en particulier au sein de l'organisation OSCE. Je me réjouis du succès de l'atelier qui s'est tenu à Paris le 31 janvier dernier sur la mise en œuvre des recommandations du bureau de Madame la représentante spéciale quant aux mesures de prévention de la lutte contre la traite des êtres humains dans le contexte des flux migratoires massifs provoqué par la guerre d'agression russe en Ukraine. L'importante participation à cet événement démontre l'engagement de tous les acteurs français à ce sujet. Et je voudrais saluer un certain nombre d'entre eux, euh, issus de la société civile, qui ont fait le, le déplacement aujourd'hui, comme chaque année. Le 11 décembre dernier, la ministre chargée de l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes et de la lutte contre les discriminations a présenté le troisième plan d'action national de lutte contre la traite des êtres humains. Ce plan d'action a une double vocation. D'abord, mieux protéger les citoyens mineurs et majeurs français ou issus des migrations contre les atteintes à la dignité humaine que constituent les différentes formes de traite. Deuxièmement, renforcer l'efficacité de notre politique pénale pour démanteler et condamner les réseaux criminels, notamment transnationaux et les exploiteurs. La mission interministérielle pour la protection des femmes contre les violences et la lutte contre la traite des êtres humains, la MIPROF, qui a coordonné le travail de rédaction de ce plan, suit désormais la mise en œuvre de celui-ci. Au-delà de l'adoption de ce troisième plan d'action, nous avons fait le choix de nous attaquer spécifiquement à la question des vulnérabilités des victimes comme cause et conséquence de la traite, comme il a été rappelé à plusieurs reprises aujourd'hui déjà. 
Cette priorité vise à mettre en exergue l'utilisation par les trafiquants des situations de vulnérabilité des victimes, telles que les addictions, les pathologies psychiatriques et ou physiques, les vulnérabilités affectives, économiques et financières à des fins d'exploitation. Les groupes criminels utilisent la technique du « lover boy » pour séduire leurs victimes et les attirer par la suite dans les, dans les activités prostitutionnelles. Aussi, cette priorité accordera une attention particulière à la protection des femmes et des filles victimes de la traite. Je ne veux pas être trop longue et je voudrais surtout euh, rappeler qu'en cette année, euh, euh, très particulière en France, puisque nous accueillerons les Jeux olympiques et paralympiques, la France a fait une priorité de cette euh, vigilance euh, à l'égard euh, de, de tous, ces, euh, tous ces risques de, de trafic dans le contexte euh, des Jeux Olympiques. Voilà, je vous remercie de votre attention et je vous souhaite une bonne continuation de, de travaux. Félicitations encore une fois. Merci. Thank you, Madame Ambassador. Um, the next person on the floor uh, is from the Department for the Fight Against Human Trafficking in Mont Montenegro called by um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation. Um, the head division for the department for Meto Montenegro, your, the floor is yours. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh, Madam Chairperson, um, we would like to, I have a great honor and pleasure to address you today on behalf of the Montenegrin delegation and on behalf of the Ministry of Interior, which coordinates the implementation of the national policy against trafficking in human beings. First of all, we would like to align to the statement of the EU and in our national capacity, would like to add that in accordance, in accordance with the absolute priority of Montenegrin government, which is to fulfill all the requirements to join the family of European states, we have intensified Five, our activities on implementation of reforms and a more robust response to this problem, both from the criminal law, law aspect and in terms of proactive and preventive approach to it at all levels. We have continuously worked on aligning our criminal legislation with the provisions of the Council of Europe and UN conventions and sources of international criminal law, as well as with the EU directive relevant to this area. It is through the recent amendments of the Criminal Code that inter alia the terminological harmonization of the terms of the child in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was carried out, and I would like also to underline the introduction of the non-punishment provision. Institutional capacity in the fight against trafficking in human beings has been straightened through several multidisciplinary bodies on operational and strategic level. These operational teams achieve significant results by increasing the number of filed criminal reports and indictments, as well as identify victims of human trafficking for various exploitative purposes. That is a confirmation of the strengthened capacity to recognize this problem among the representatives of, of institution. In that regard, I would like to highlight the training that we have developed with the support of the OSC mission to Montenegro, the guidelines for conducting an interview with persons suspect of being THB victims with a set of questions, in three years, 10 trainings have been conducted for a total number of 149 representatives, primarily from the police, centers for social work, and NGOs working with victims. The focus of our activities is also to strengthen the res resilience of children and young people in particular in relation to this phenomena, in connection with which we have found the main alliance in the efforts through education and aver awareness raising. We continuously conduct trainings for those who work directly with children, teachers in primary and secondary schools on the ways to transfer knowledge about THB uh, through educational system uh, uh, in a, uh, one of the training program on the topic educational system in the prevention of child trafficking, illicit marriage and economic exploitation of children. These forms of exploitation are precisely the ones that are happening under the guise of customs and tradition. 
We have also paid special attention to the issue of increased vulnerability to trafficking in human beings to a population of migration caused by the war conflicts and also for foreigners seeking international protection. We created and developed multilingual brochures with key information about THB. In order to raise the general public awareness about this phenomena, last year in cooperation with the International Organization for Migration and local NGOs, we implemented a campaign to mark the World Day against trafficking in persons in 15 Montenegrin municipalities, where we talk with hundreds of citizens, tourists, and travelers about the phenomenon of THB. We also allocate funds to support NGO programs and projects in the field of protection and promotion of human and minority rights. We are also committed to further investing efforts in promoting gender equality, combating violence against women and children, early forced marriages through the adoption of strategic acts, campaigns, educational workshops, and trainings. We recognize the needs to further develop online prevention campaigns at all levels. This is certainly an area that should occupy an important place in the next strategic documents when it comes to prevention, whose drafting will be supported in the upcoming period by the OIC mission to Montenegro. Finally, please allow me to underline that Montenegro reminds the dedicating to acting on bilateral and multilateral level in the domain of combating trafficking in human beings as an active and reliable partner in order to attain the best possible quality of joint future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your remarks from Montenegro. And now the next in line is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation, followed by the the general elect cultural and diplomacy from Belarus. Um, yeah, to the Russian Russian delegation, the floor is yours. Уважаемые госпожа спецпредставитель и координатор, уважаемые спикеры, спасибо вам большое за вклад в сегодняшнюю дискуссию. Российская Федерация рассматривает ежегодные конференции Альянса как важную площадку для конструктивного обмена мнениями, накопленным опытом, продвижения вперед на пути противодействия столь серьезной проблеме, как торговля людьми. В этой связи вынуждены выразить свое категорическое несогласие с прозвучавшими сегодня на открытии политизированными заявлениями и оценками состояния дел в области борьбы с торговой людьми, в первую очередь выступление действующего председателя ОБСЕ, министра иностранных дел Мальта господина Борча. Его непозволительные ремарки в отношении нашей страны не только не идут на пользу общему делу, собравшему сегодня участников конференции, но и грубо противоречат правилам поведения действующего председательства, определенного решениями СМИ и постсовета нашей организации. То же самое относится и к высказываниям директора ДИПЧ господина Микачи. Участники конференции Альянса, как и других профильных международных форумов, сходятся во мнении, что для действительно эффективной борьбы с трафикингом необходим комплексный и многопрофильный подход. Считаем, что именно предотвращение является краеугольным пластом. Наиболее уязвимыми группами являются женщины и дети. В нынешней реальности небывалых миграционных потоков, вызванных прежде всего дестабилизацией обстановки в ряде регионов Ближнего Востока и Африки, Многочисленной уязвимой категорией лиц являются нелегальные мигранты и беженцы. Многие мигранты для пресечения границ по суше и морю пользуются услугами нелегальных перевозчиков. Простите. С еще большими рисками мигранты, прежде всего несопровождаемые совершеннолетние, несовершеннолетние и женщины, сталкиваются по прибытии в страны назначения или транзита. Торговцы и вербовщики, в чьи руки они попадают, используют их в целях сексуальной эксплуатации, подневольного труда, вовлечения в преступную деятельность и попрошайничество. Правоохранительные органы зачастую не способны отследить судьбу многих из этих женщин и детей из-за нелегального статуса. Соответственно, страдает достоверность статистики по этому вопросу, не говоря уже о поиске и помощи жертвам. Наиболее, наиболее пугающие цифры приводятся различными международными организациями по пропавшим детям мигрантам. Полагаем, что нужно открывать больше каналов для легальной миграции, налаживать систему помощи несовершеннолетним мигрантам, которая должна объединять усилия правоохранительных органов, социальных служб НПО. Кроме того, необходимо обеспечить надлежащие условия в центрах размещения мигрантов, во временных лагерях, 
так как именно нечеловеческие условия, а нередко и применение к ним пыток заставляют мигрантов покидать места размещения и попадать в сети преступников. К сожалению, в ряде регионов мира обстановка не просто нестабильная, а конфликтная. И в такой ситуации крайне сложно оказывать детям жертвам, либо потенциальным жертвам торговли людьми необходимую помощь. Что касается недостаточно изученных форм торговли людьми, то недооцененной формой трафигинга по-прежнему остается торговля людьми в целях извлечения органов, клеток и тканей человека. Ее жертвами становятся как дети и женщины, так и мужчины, в том числе военнослужащие в зонах конфликта. Деятельность черных трансплантологов, которая зачастую носит трансграничный характер, крайне сложно раскрыть и пресечь. Осложняется такая работа еще больше в тех случаях, когда преступников фактически покрывают власть. Приветствуем, что при предыдущем спецпредставителе и координаторе ОБСЕ по торговле людьми, по борьбе с торговлей людьми, э, господин Рич, Ричи, организация начала заниматься данной проблемой. В 2020 году прошла встреча экспертов по торговле людьми в целях извлечения органов. Полагаем, необходимо продолжать эту работу на площадке ОБСЕ. С позитивом отмечаем также работу спецпредставителя и координатора по борьбе с торговлей людьми госпожи Джонстон, начатую по изучению взаимосвязи между торговлей людьми и распространением наркотических средств. Желаем участникам конференции конструктивной и плодотворной дискуссии. Спасибо за внимание. From head of division from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Russian Federation. And now, next in line, as I mentioned, is um, the Directive General for Multicultural Diplomacy, Belarus, followed by the delegation from Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Coordinator. Um, thank you for this opportunity to intervene. Uh, such landmark events as today's. Um, is an excellent opportunity to reflect on the achieved progress and to look to look uh, into the future of our collective works. And, and, and I hope that uh, our discussion this day and the, the upcoming day will will provide the excellent uh, possibility for, for all of us to exchange the views and reflecting on some, um, uh, on some um, uh, opinions uh, already discussed today and some opinions already raised today, I would like to um, uh, say that uh, um, uh, the gravity of the current trafficking situation in, is worsened by multiplying factors, and it's al already been uh, mentioned today. And these multiplying factors are humanitarian and health crisis, conflicts, um, climate change, and weaponization of techn technological progress. And such multi-dimensional nature of the trafficking crimes uh, requires a comprehensive response from, from, from the international community and multilateral organizations, and that is why we are all here, and we hope on fruitful cooperation in this matter. Some of the uh, recent reports of the uh, multilateral organizations, and including some structures as UNODC from last year, have highlighted several alarming findings showing that uh, trafficking, particularly trafficking for sexual exploitation, has become less um, detectable, with more victims having to stay on their own with their, with their problems and rather than the, uh, with the support of their immediate uh, family and community, law enforcement or civil society. And such pro proliferation of mixed forms of exploitation, of course, have um, surfaced you know, um, as major have surfaced major problem, uh, the problem of 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 difficulty of detection of these crimes, and uh, another aspect has been uh, has gained uh, unfortunate prominence is, uh, is is trafficking in persons in supply chains, and during the last years, thirty uh, uh, second session of the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice in Vienna. Uh, our delegation facilitated the consensually adopted resolution on taking action against trafficking in persons in business operations, public procurement, and supply chain for goods and services, which contains a set of practical recommendations addressing this issue. And same concerns the resolution of the uh, Commission on Crime Prevention and Justice uh, regarding the human organs, which is also um, is a is 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 a great example of uh, how the international community uh, is fighting against the uh, overlooked forms of human trafficking. 
Um, technologies, as I already mentioned, particularly the internet, uh, provide new risks for potential victims to be targeted, regardless of their social economic status. And so as it's already been mentioned, uh, even even uh, educated and highly educated people knowing several languages are 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 usually targeted by human traffickers, and uh, this uh, poses another problem for for uh, the international community to uh, deal with this uh, issue and. Um, <clears throat> um, exploitation of victims through the use of technology also creates risks for uh, re-victimization and challenges for successful rehabilitation of such survivors. And um, uh, in this regard, state actors, law enforcement, civil society, and other relevant stakeholders, including academia and private sectors, need to expand their partnership to harness the power of technology to combat trafficking through the technology-based solutions from awareness raising campaigns to supporting the admissibility of electronic devices and evidence in the modern world of social media and uh, online platforms we believe that technology can and should be the very tool to reach every victim and to leave no one behind thank you so much Um, thank you for those uh, remarks. Um, uh, in mindful of time, we apologize. Uh, we're going to have one last uh, statement from the delegation from Georgia. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, esteemed guests, it is my honor to address you at 24th Conference of the Alliance Against Trafficking in Persons. Today, we convene with the shared purpose to combat one of the gravest injustice of our time. Human trafficking is a blight on our collective humanity, depriving individuals of their dignity, freedom, and basic human rights. The issue particularly takes heightened significance in the light of the ongoing Russian aggression against Ukraine. For the government of Georgia, combating human trafficking stands as an inevocal priority. We have established a robust, relevant legal framework supported by the comprehensive, proactive, and collaborated action coordinated by the Interagency Coordinating Council on Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. The Council brings together governmental agencies, civil society organizations, and international partners, harnessing their expertise to combat trafficking effectively. In our efforts to combat trafficking, a comprehensive analysis and identification of potential target groups are paramount. While taking about, talking about vulnerable groups of the uh, THP crime, it should be noted that for years, the issue of children living uh, and working on the streets has been one of the main challenges. To this end, government of Georgia has elaborated the governmental strategy on protection of homeless children from violence, including THB and its action plan that is soon to be enacted. Yet, this is but one facet of our endeavor as the diversity of trafficking crimes and potential victims necessitates a multifaceted approach. Hence, investing in prevention measures is a crucial part of our anti-THB policy. We unleash a proactive, uh, proactive information campaign under the Common Information Strategy. Forms of THB are developing rapidly. That, at one hand, requires proactive identification and investigation, and on the other, constant capacity building of all the actors involved. To that end, mobile groups and tax task force under the Ministry of Interior and Prosecutor's Office regularly and proactively check places of risk and interview employees. They're aiming, uh, uh, they're aiming not only to reveal the facts of the crime, but also to prevent its commission. It is important to remember that behind criminal investigations are individuals. Recognizing their vulnerabilities, Georgia's national referral mechanism, acknowledged by the OAC as successful, ensures both presumed and officially identified victims receive tailored rehabilitation and resocialization services. 
Moreover, given the fact that children are the most vulnerable group, a special uh, psychological social service center, so-called Barnahus model for minors who are victims of sexual violence, including sexual exploitation is in place, offering child-friendly, multidisciplinary, and interagency model for responding to child violence cases. In closing, while the future tendencies of the trafficking remains uncertain, our collective bristle remains steadfast. Together, we can forge policies that are robust, comprehensive, and collaborative, paving a way for a future free from the scourge of trafficking. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, mindful of time, um, would like to uh, give a floor to German, uh, the delegates from German, and followed with the delegates, the delegation from Ukraine. Please keep it under two minutes because we are closing at six. Sehr geehrte Frau Sonderbotschafterin Dr. Johnstone, liebe Carrie, uh, sehr geehrtes Panel, Exzellenzen, sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Im Anschluss an das EU-Statement möchte ich die Gelegenheit nutzen, auch noch einige für Deutschland bedeutsame Punkte ähm, hervorzuheben. Zuallererst möchte ich Helga Schmidt danken, die als Generalsekretärin von Beginn ihrer Amtszeit an die Mehrheit, äh, die Arbeit gegen Menschenhandel priorisiert und vorangetrieben hat. Dies hat die OSZE befähigt, ihr Potenzial im Kampf gegen Menschenhandel zu nutzen und zu vergrößern, für die Menschen der gesamten Region und darüber hinaus. Ihnen, Frau Sonderbeauftragte Johnstone, gilt unser ganz besonderer Dank für die Ausrichtung dieser wichtigen Veranstaltung. Sie und Ihr Team sind eine treibende Kraft im weltweiten Kampf gegen den Menschenhandel und zeigen tagtäglich, welchen Mehrwert die OSZE für die Menschen erbringt. Durch Ihr Engagement erhalten Betroffene und Überlebende eine Stimme und sie weisen Wege auf, wie wir durch gemeinsame Anstrengungen die Ausbeutung von Menschen verhindern können. Trotz der erzielten Fortschritte bleibt Menschenhandel ein verheerendes Problem und wird durch Konflikte und deren verantwortliche Auslöser weiter verschärft. Der unprovozierte und durch nichts zu rechtfertigende illegale Angriffskrieg Russlands gegen die Ukraine hat in den letzten zwei Jahren leider weitere Millionen von Menschen, insbesondere Frauen und Kinder, in Gefahr gebracht. Ebenfalls vor Beginn der brutalen völkerrechtswidrigen russischen Invasion der Ukraine im Jahr 2022 erlebten wir Jahre der fortwährenden Aggression gegen die Ukraine und damit verbundenen Vertreibung und Flucht mit einer erhöhten Gefahr des Menschenhandels. Wir erleben die größte Vertreibung von Menschen in Europa seit dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. Gerade diese Menschen sind am verwundbarsten. Und daher ist Ihre Arbeit, Dr. Johnston, angefangen bei der Prävention über den Schutz der Opfer bis hin zur strafrechtlichen Verfolgung und Verurteilung der Täter wichtiger denn je. Und genau das macht die OSZE im Kampf gegen Menschenhandel so wichtig. Durch ihren umfassenden multidimensionalen Sicherheitsansatz ist die OSZE ideal positioniert, um bei der Entwicklung wirksamer und umfassender Antworten zu unterstützen. Menschenhandel entmenschlicht und beraubt die Betroffenen ihrer Würde ihrer Freiheit und ihrer Grundrechte. Es liegt in unserer aller Verantwortung, diesem Übel entschieden entgegenzutreten. Deutschland ist und bleibt ein starker Unterstützer der OSZE-Aktivitäten zur Eindämmung des Menschenhandels. Und Sie, Frau Sonderbotschafterin, können auch im Jahr 2024 auf die substanzielle und starke Unterstützung Deutschlands zählen. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much for your remarks. And lastly, we want to hear from uh, Ukraine delegation and keeping in mind two minutes before we close. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, good evening, distinguished participants. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, the OC Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings, Dr. Uh, Kerry Johnstone and her office for uh, organizing this uh, important uh, conference. As it was stressed by the uh, OC uh, chairperson in office, Minister Borch, uh, OG's Director Mukachi, and many other speakers, uh, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine uh, has a detrimental impact uh, on the civilian population of Ukraine, in particular women and uh, children. Uh, Russia's war has forced over 14 million uh, people in Ukraine from their homes as uh, refugees and, and IDPs, which represents around one third of the Ukrainian population. Uh, it, remain, it remains the largest humanitarian displacement crisis uh, in the world uh, today. Moreover, uh, thousands of uh, Ukrainians, including children, 
uh, forcibly deported from the invaded territories to Russia, including uh, the most uh, remote regions. In Russia, they face intimidation, ill treatment, uh, labor and sexual exploitation, trafficking in persons and other abuses and uh, threats. In a number of international independent reports on human rights violations amid uh, Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, it was stressed that the massive displacement exposes children to numerous risks, such as the risk of being killed or injured during the displacement, the risk of uh, human trafficking and exploitation, the risk of child labor, the risk of forced recruitment, and the risk of gender-based violence. Appropriate measures m must be put in place to protect children against these risks. The forcible transfer and deportation of Ukrainian children also expose them to such grave violations as a change of the child's personal status, including citizenship, separation from parents or guardians, illegal adoption, and other violations or abuses leading to their forced assimilation in Russia. Such actions encompass numerous violations of international humanitarian law and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child by the Russian Federation. These and many other effects were widely confirmed by the last year's OEC Moscow Mechanism mission of experts on the deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia, which established in Terralia that Russia's actions may amount to a crime against humanity of deportation or forcible transfer of population. Given the gravity and the scale of the serious international crime against Ukrainian children, the International Criminal Court issued last year the arrest warrants uh, against uh, Russian President and his Commissioner uh, for Children's Rights. Uh, the delegation of Ukraine would like to underline the need for the OEC uh, to pay special attention to the fate of all those illegally deported Ukrainian children, Ukrainian uh, children in flagrant uh, breach of uh, IHL and uh, undertake concrete steps to help ensure the immediate and, and safe return to Ukraine and uh, as well as the reunification with their families and uh, true uh, legal guardians. I thank you, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and uh, those who have provided the statements, we appreciate. And I, we've learned a lot from different countries. Um, as time, uh, we've run out, we've run out of time. We're hoping that the panelists will give some last, last remark. But I want to make some uh, few uh, takeaway points. I think we put a face on who are vulnerable, who are the vulnerable people. We've, they've, from uh, those people on the move, from, from people who, uh, who are minorities, they mentioned the, the people from Roma, they mentioned people with disabilities and people who are displaced. So for me, what I learned is that at the end of the day, it requires a, a comprehensive trauma-informed victim-centered by the whole community approach and leaving no one behind. Uh, I, for one, I see I see that the way forward is having a united front, uh, looking at it as um, a quote that I want to quote, uh, to borrow from Benjamin Franklin, that justice will not be served until those who are not affected are as outraged as those who are. Are we outraged enough? Because sometimes we are very far from the actual truth. We are very far from the real experience of what horror human trafficking does. So if we are outraged enough, we'll be able to leave no one behind. Um, I don't know if you have a bit of remarks. I will just add my thanks uh, to our esteemed panelists um, for this great conversation and also for the interventions from the floor. And thank you for the great first day uh, of this year's Alliance Conference. We will resume tomorrow at 9 a.m. for panel two. Uh, and now we will have a reception um, in the same area where the coffee break was. Now that you are all welcome to attend. Thank you so much.